Good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting of the committee in 2018. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off their mobile phones and any member using electronic devices to access committee papers during the meeting should please ensure that these are turned to silent. Our first item of business today is an evidence session in relation to the committee's inquiry on immigration with the Migration Advisory Committee's chair, Professor Alan Manning, and evidence today will be taken via video conference. Uh, can I welcome Professor Manning to the meeting? Good morning, Professor Manning. Can you hear me? Uh, good morning. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Uh, could, could I start um, by um, maybe uh, focusing on possibly one of the, the headlines of, of your inquiry um, with regards to migration? Um, you propose to re restrict uh, what you call the low-skilled uh, migration uh, route, and uh, EE citizens will in future um, apply through the Tier 2 uh, visa system. Uh, that would rule out 75% uh, of the EEA uh, migrants that we uh, have at the moment and the, the, the salary threshold of £30,000 uh, uh, salary uh, for uh, migrants would uh, severely restrict uh, the number of people who are able to come uh, to the UK and Scotland in particular. Um, can I just, in, in terms of the £30,000 salary, I know that you are uh, proposing to include 142 uh, new medium skilled jobs uh, within that umbrella of the tier two uh, visa. What percentage of these uh, medium skilled jobs in Scotland would meet the £30,000 salary threshold? Um, well, there are a number of questions in there. Would you like me to take that last one first or? or yes, um, um, whichever, is, is, uh, whichever okay. you feel best. Um, I, I think the, um, if we sort of t take um, the first point, um, our proposal that we should, you should look very carefully at whether there needs to be a lower skilled um, migration route. I think it's a little bit misleading um, to think that that would mean that 75% of the existing um, migrants would um, not be eligible to be here because the existing stock would remain. So this would be really should be seen as a proposal which would be restricting the future flow rather than influencing uh, the current stock. And even in the absence of an explicit lower skill work route, um, there actually always are quite substantial flows of lower skill migrants through other routes such as family. So if we look at the non-EU EU route at the moment, there isn't a, an explicit uh, lower skill migration uh, route for most of them. And yet we do see quite a lot of uh, non-EU migrants um, in lower skill work. So although I, I do accept it, our proposal would be to restrict the, the future flow. I don't think it um, should be seen as um, threatening the current people who are here all, already. Um, in terms of the... Um, 30,000 threshold. Um, our view for why that was appropriate was that, first of all, that is very close to median earnings, um, both in the UK as a whole and in Scotland. Um, and any uh, migrant that is coming uh, in below uh, median full-time earnings is in a little bit making the UK or Scotland a, a lower wage kind of economy. And that isn't really um, our vision uh, for the future. Um, you, you are correct to say that um, the medium skill occupations that we do propose extending the current tier two to um, will find it harder to um, meet the, the salary thresholds. Um, so, for example, if in Scotland, if one takes um, what are the sort of level four or five, so these would be the upper medium skill jobs, uh, something like 52% uh, of um, um, jobs in those occupations in Scotland at the moment pay more than 30,000. Uh, for the lower skill, um, medium skill jobs, it's, it's 36%. Those are very close to the national um, averages. Now, we do think that, that although that is a bit more of a stretch for jobs in those sectors, that is appropriate the, because the reason for uh, wanting to allow migrants 
um, into those jobs is to alleviate potential problems with skill shortages. But if there are skill shortages, we do think it's appropriate that there is upward pressure on wages uh, within those sectors. And we see these salary thresholds as um, helping to ensure that. Right. Thank you for that answer. Of course, you, you talk about the UK as a whole and include Scotland in that, but the median salary for a worker in Scotland is actually less than the UK average. And in response to this committee's immigration inquiry, several employers stated that the £30,000 threshold was far too high. Uh, do you acknowledge the regional variations that there are across the UK? Um, we did look at the regional variations. I think if one looks at the sort of median full-time annual earnings, um, the latest figures were published a, a week or so ago and relate to April of this year. And I think the, the difference between the UK average and the Scottish um, average is a few hundred pounds uh, on a base of a, what is slightly under £30,000. So I think the median level of earnings in Scotland is actually not very different. Uh, from the UK average. Um, and because that's one of the reasons that we didn't think that the regional differences in earnings were sufficiently large in order to justify different salary thresholds in different parts of, of the UK. I mean, we did look at this question, and I think if one was to go down the route of having uh, regional differentiation, it is much more likely that one would have higher salary thresholds for London and the southeast of England. Uh, than you would, for example, to have a separate sal lower salary threshold for, for Scotland. Um, the other thing that businesses to told us is that there's no obvious ready supply of local UK-born workers uh, to fill the low-skilled and medium-skilled roles. Where, where would you suggest that these workers come from if that's what businesses are actually telling us? I, th I think that sometimes individual businesses um, see migration as a shortage, uh, as a solution to shortages and difficulties in recruitment. But I think the evidence is that when one looks at the economy as a whole, it, it's not really that effective. If I try and give a particular example, an employer who might have a um, shortage, uh, a vacancy at the moment, will naturally think that if I hire a migrant, um, I've, I've solved that shortage. But that migrant then earns money and then spends money. And when they do that, they're creating um, demand for labour elsewhere in the economy. So really all that happens is that one shuffles shortages around the economy. Um, and the evidence that we consider suggests that when one has migration into economy, one is roughly adding to labour supply and labour demand in roughly equal balance. Uh, and that is the reason why it doesn't really alter the balance between labour demand and labour supply. But you see, Oxford Economics um, said that uh, because of the, the lack or the reduced numbers uh, of EE workers, um, uh, which could take place as a result of if, if your recommendations were implemented, that um, we may actually have to have tax rises to compensate um, for the, the withdrawal of the, the, the money that they're putting into the economy. Um, do you think Oxford economics are, are wrong in, in that regard? I, I think it's important. No, I don't think they're, they're wrong. I think, I mean, we commissioned Oxford economics to do some work for our report as well. That makes it very clear that at the moment, when one takes um, EEA migrants as a whole, um, they are paying more in uh, taxes than they're receiving in benefits or, or public services. But that doesn't mean that every single one of those migrants is um, contributing more in taxes. And our proposals would mean that actually um, we think that the, the contribution would be even more positive. So we, don't th we think that if the changes we propose are done, done correctly, that actually the public finances would um, improve, although I wouldn't want to um, exaggerate the likely benefits, but they, they wouldn't get worse because one is being more selective about migrants. And if one selects in part on earnings, one is selecting for people who generally pay higher taxes. I could just press you on that. Oxford Economics say that tax rises may be necessary to compensate for the disproportionately high contribution EEA nationals make to the UK finances. Are they wrong? 
But I, I think that doesn't distinguish between different types of EEA nationals, and there's a huge difference between... Overall? You're um, talking you know, about overall? Overall, they pay more currently, but our proposal is not to um, restrict all of them. It is to shift towards a more highly, highly skilled. I mean, EEA migration since 2004 has been predominantly into lower skilled employment. And that represents now sort of 60% of the EEA migrants. But the Oxford economics work um, that, they, uh, that we commissioned from them suggested that those 60% from the accession countries only contribute 6% of the total surplus of all EEA migrants. And some of those uh, um, accession migrants will themselves be highly skilled. So we think that if you restrict lower skill migration, it will actually improve the public finances. I see. OK, I shall pass on to Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I wanted to ask some questions around the regional variation in the immigration system that the committee considered. Uh, we had a debate in Parliament at the start of this year where there, were, there, there was, I would say, broad agreement across the chamber with all the political parties in a different place on that scale. But there was, I think, support for a coherent UK immigration policy, which within it would contain the ability to have some regional variations that would respond to the sectoral needs we have in Scotland, to the decline in birth rate and the issues of elderly population. Um, the committee has completely ruled that out as a has been I don't know they kind of suggest that it's not possible and I see one of the comments that suggest that that would be a political rather than an economic decision while I think the uh, consensus within parliament that all parties were committed to a degree of variation showed that it was a response to our economic and our demographic situation rather than a political choice but could you maybe explain more the committee's thinking behind that decision Yes. No, our view on what we saw as a political decision was the issue of whether um, immigration should be a devolved or a reserved matter. So we don't express any view on that one way or the other, either in favour of the status quo or in, or, or in favour of it becoming a devolved matter. Um, but even within the current system, it is obviously possible to have some degree of regional di differentiation. Um, there is already a, a separate Scottish shortage occupation list, although the differences are relatively um, small. Um, I, I think our argument was that they're really the economic case for having a distinctively Scottish migration policy um, was not particularly strong. Um, I mean, I think you mentioned um, the sort of demographic issues. Oh. For, for Sorry example. to interrupt, but... So you didn't think the argument was there for a specific Scottish, but the document does recognise that maybe Wales and Northern England has similar issues. Did the committee consider a variation, a variation model across the UK that would meet the needs of diff not just Scotland, but would be a proper regional system with some um, degree of flexibility we, we for did, uh, regional needs? Yes. I mean, I think that the issue that comes up here is, um, and it's not unique to migration policy, things like the national minimum wage are similar, um, that there's a trade-off between having a system that's relatively simple and um, easy to understand. And one of the complaints of many employers about the current system is how complex it is. And obviously, regional differentiation would introduce a, a new level of uh, complexity into the system. Um, that versus sort of differing kind of economic needs. I mean, our view was that we didn't, our view is that the regional differences are not so large as to justify um, having regionally differentiated policy. If one was to have one, I think it would be different for London um, and the South East um, compared to, um, to everywhere else. But I think the problem with one of the issues with a regional migration policy, say if it was easier to migrate into some parts of the UK uh, than the others, is um, the, the question of whether those migrants actually stay there in the longer run. Because um, if they don't stay there in the longer run, you're not actually addressing the demographic problem which you were, you were hoping to, to solve. And I think experience um, in some parts, you know, Canada, for example, and Australia do have experiences of having some region, specifically regional debt visas. And I think the, the evidence on the success of those schemes is a bit, bit mixed. I think the more remote parts of Canada uh, really do struggle to actually re retain immigrants who, are, who enter under specific regional visas. 
Because did you look in detail at the Canadian system? That is the one that's held up as a, a way in which you could have a national immigration policy that, that contains regional variations. Another point I wanted to raise was around the focus seems very much on work visas, which can be fairly short term. The, the issue, one of the issues we have in Scotland is once people come on the visa, is encouraging people to settle in Scotland, to become part of our society and, and continue to live here. I'm not convinced that the system that's been proposed really gives people that kind of long-term settlement option. It seems very focused on this is an immediate economic need. You come in and serve that, and then that's your time up type model. Um, well, the Tier 2 work permit system is a, is a system with a path to settlement. Um, so it is possible for migrants to um, come in under that yeah. scheme and after a number of years. They have to meet some criteria to attain, um, you know, indefinite leave to remain and eventually citizenship. So, I mean, I think that's sort of, you know, quite a, uh, you know, that's a fairly kind of common system around around the world. So I, I wouldn't describe this as a a, 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 a sort of work um, immigration system, which is primarily um, temporary. Um, I mean, I think on the, the Canadian point, I mean, we, we, we have looked, I mean, I wouldn't say how much, I mean, we have looked at the Canadian system. Um, and I think, you know, the, the most interesting part of that Canadian system is looking at really how successful different parts of Canada have been in, in retaining um, sort of medium, longer term migrants who come in under, un, under those sort of regional visas. And as I said, sort of areas like the Atlantic provinces um, only managed, seem to manage to retain something like 40% of migrants who enter under those schemes. So it's not actually a terribly effective way in um, preventing, for example, de depopulation in the Atlantic provinces. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, thank you. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning, uh, Professor. Um, has the MAC done any modelling on the likely impact of its proposals on future patterns of migration? In Scotland, um, not what we haven't done is focus uh, is pro produce estimates of what we think the consequences would be on migration flows, either in Scotland or in the UK as a whole. I mean, the reason for that is that we think it's more important to ensure um, that the migrants who come to the UK are um, providing um, are. are Value, providing value are the ones that we would like, um, and we're, we're not so um, concerned about what the actual numbers are. Um, and those numbers can be extremely volatile because they're not just influenced by UK migration policy, they're influenced by um, economic circumstances in other parts of, of the world, how the UK economy is doing. No, that's an interesting answer, um, particularly uh, your comments regarding the, the numbers. Um, have you ever heard of uh, a location called Inverclyde? The, sorry, the Have you ever heard of a place called Inverclyde, a local authority in Scotland called Inverclyde? Um, I, I, my guess is that it would be close to the Clyde, but I wouldn't be able to put it exactly uh, okay. on, on a map. No, okay, I just, I'm, going to, I'm going to just mention some numbers for you, because it's really important, because of your comment a few moments ago. Inverclyde's population has uh, decreased by 8.9% uh, between 1997 and 2017. Scotland has increased by 67 the age uh, groups uh, within Inverclyde between 97 and 2017, the 25 to 44 category has decreased by 28.6%, with the 75 plus increasing by 20.9%. The population projections for 2016 to 2026, Inverclyde is to have a 3.8% decrease, while Scotland is 3.2% increase. And <clears throat> my final point is the population projections uh, for the age categories. The 16 to 24 age group between 2016 and 2016 will decrease by 13.2%, but the 75 plus will increase by 20.8%. Where are we going to get the people to come in to actually work in the social care sector, to actually deal with an ageing population? I mean, I think... From what, from what you're describing is the, um, I mean, that sounds to me like an area that used to have quite a lot of heavy industry um, and those local industries are not doing so, um, so well at the moment. I'm not sure if that is um, accurate. 
Um, I think the problem is that if you say, well, <coughs> is migration a solution to um, Inverclyde's problems? The issue is that the reasons why um, local people are leaving Inverclyde will also apply to um, migrants. You may be able to, reco to uh, recruit migrants in the short run to work in social care, but it's quite likely that as soon as they have the freedom to do so, um, they will then um, leave um, for better economic opportunities elsewhere. Um, I mean, the Canadian sort of live-in caregiver program, which is sort of has some similarities, though isn't I identical, you know, has had this, these problems that after 10 years, this is a sort of specific sort of social care visa, um, that after 10 years, only something like 10% um, of uh, the people who'd come in through that route were actually still working in social care because the fundamental problem is that working, working in social care is, is not very attractive. And so our view was that social care faces very, very serious problems, but we're not convinced that migration is the solution. It's much more about um, making sure that that has attractive terms and conditions, both to um, UK, existing UK residents and migrants alike. Um, and obviously that needs solving the financing problems. I'm not saying those are easy problems, but that's what our view on social care was. But Professor, 25 local authority areas in Scotland actually experience negative natural change. So there are 32 local authorities in Scotland. Uh, there is an ageing population. And uh, people are going to uh, go from one local authority area to another. I think we all agree and accept uh, that as a reality. But 25 have actually had a reduction in their population. Uh, people have got to come from somewhere to actually work. That's just one example of the social care sector. But people have got to come from somewhere to go and work. Uh, in, in that particular sector, across Scotland, not just in the areas where there's a population increase. So where are they going to come from? I mean, I, well, I think it's, it, our, our view is that there, you know, in, in the case of social care, um, there are plenty of domestic people, workers, existing residents who are capable of working in that sector. It's at the moment that they simply think that they have got better opportunities elsewhere because the terms and conditions in social care are, are very, um, very unattractive. Um, and I think, you know, I, I would sort of really go back to the point that you may be able to recruit migrants in the short run to plug these gaps. But unless you address the underlying fundamental cause of the problems is addressed, you will not solve them in the, in the medium to, to long run. Because, you know, for example, I described the Canadian system, um, the problems that ran into, they've actually closed this earlier this spring to, to new entrants because they thought it wasn't actually, not because they, ha they haven't got a problem with ageing population, they have as, you know, mo many um, countries have, it's that it wasn't actually being very successful in addressing the problem. But people who go to work in that particular sector um, uh, will have special, uh, a special skill set uh, to work in that sector. Uh, and they accept uh, employers uh, and businesses, uh, they have to uh, train people uh, to get people into the sector as well. So this isn't just solely an issue that, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that migration is going, to, uh, is, going to, is going to solve. I accept that. But at the same time, uh, you want to make sure that people are going to go into that particular sector who have that relevant skill set. And if it can take some time to train someone up to get them, uh, to get those skills, as compared to someone who potentially has them now, who can go into work in that sector. And I gave you the example of my local authority area as to how acute that issue is. Uh, and, and I've not heard anything from you that's actually going to provide a solution or an answer to actually help uh, with my local authority area, but also others across Scotland. I mean, I think at the moment, if one takes, for example, the, the sort of the, main, the biggest occupation in social care, which is, is care assistance, um, there actually is not that much training that most employers uh, require before employing someone at a care assistant. And a very high fraction of those, um, of those care assistants are paid the minimum wage. Um, so I think that, you know, it, it's... It, it, I mean, it, there are arguments that actually it should, there should be more training, um, but obviously training costs money. And again, this is something that the sector is, is very short of. 
Um, but at the moment, that is not really, um, I think, an accurate description of the, the main uh, bulk of employment um, in, in these sectors. Um, so I think I, I, I would go back to simply saying that, you know, migration is not a very effective way to do this. If, for example, one says, what about free movement as a solution to um, social care's problems? Social care has a lower share of EU migrants than the economy as a whole. Um, the same is true of, as the, of the NHS. So if you're very worried about social care, I would say that the existing migration system we have uh, is not a very effective one at solving its problems. Um, actually, we did flag up social care as being the one lower skill sector that we were uh, very concerned about. Um, but I just go back to saying that we, we really don't think that migration uh, might give you a short term um, fix but it isn't a medium or longer term solution. Thank, thank you. Um, before we move on, um, Professor, uh, you mentioned on a couple of occasions the situation in Canada and suggested that um, your inquiries showed that um, the regional uh, variation didn't work. Um, as you know, our committee um, conducted its own immigration uh, inquiry and were ad advised by uh, Dr. Eve Hepburn of Henry University. Um, she pointed to a Canadian government evaluation of its regional migration scheme, uh, which uh, used income tax returns to find out where people stayed. And they found that 82% of migrants actually stayed in the region that they were originally allocated to. So um, was your research into Canada more in depth than the Canadian government's research? Um, well, I mean, the Canadian government research that I'm um aware of. I mean, I think there's a very big difference in those sort of retention rates across Canada as a whole and in the different provinces of Canada. So if, for example, you take the areas of Canada that are doing economically very well, we're going to talk about Ontario, Ontario, British Columbia, um, sort of Manitoba and places, um, there you would see very high retention rates. But if you talk about areas like the Atlantic provinces, which are far more remote communities uh, with more bigger demographic challenges, there you saw a retention rates that were a lot, lot lower. And of course, those are the it, areas that yeah. this is that these are meant to help. Sorry to interrupt, and I, I do accept your point that there are variations in retention rates, but according to the, the, the Canadian government research that we have, the Atlantic region that you mentioned, which has the lowest retention rate, still had a 56% retention rate. And if you've got real challenges in terms of sectors, I would have thought that 56% retention rate was, was really rather good. Um, well, I think that's a, a little bit. I mean, I'm not sure whether the 56% and the number I make it makes a bit of a difference over what time horizon. So I'm not quite sure whether we're on the same. But I, I, I think, you know, when I described it, when I first started talking about it, I described the evidence as, as, as mixed. <coughs> we're not convinced that um, if you've got problems with, um, you know, sort of depopulation in some areas, uh, that migration is a particularly effective solution to that, that the roots of that depopulation are in sort of economic disadvantage and so on. And we think that actually the, the policies one should have to reduce those regional inequalities is much more about addressing that economic disadvantage. And so there's a danger that sort of migration is used as, as a way of avoiding really addressing the fundamental causes of those regional inequalities. Oh, no, thank you. Uh, Annabel Ewing. Thank you, convener. Good morning, uh, Professor Manning. Um, I, I note, uh, in terms of the composition uh, of the, the Migration Advisory Committee, that all of the panel members are drawn from only one nation of the UK, that is England. Could you perhaps clarify why that is? Um, well, I mean, the, I mean, the application process is open to everybody from, the, um, from all parts of the UK. Um, and, you know, then there's a process to select um, who, who are seen as the, the most suitable candidates. I mean, it's not the case that any member is thought of as representing any particular geographical um, constituency. And I wouldn't think it was appropriate for this kind of committee to have um, members who are representing a, a, a sort of particular constituency. But we, we, we do make quite a lot of effort in order to make sure that we 
you know, come to Scotland, come to Northern Ireland, go to the, uh, Wales and so on, and the regions of the UK, so that we do have um, an accurate picture of what people feel about migration in all parts of the UK. It's just clever. I mean, Scotland obviously is not a region uh, of the UK, it's a nation. But what, in drawing up the report, what um, specific modelling was carried out vis-à-vis uh, -vis Scotland to, to you know, further the, the recommendations of your report, if any? Could you perhaps clarify? Yes, I mean, the, the area, I mean, the, the sort of specific, um, the Scotland-specific aspects were discussed more in, in the um, interim update that we published actually in March than we did in the final report in September. Um, so I think many of the issues actually in Scotland are actually not very different from um, the rest of the UK because... But, sorry to interrupt, that may be in your assessment, but was there any specific modelling carried out in Scotland given the particular uh, issues that we face, the devolved uh, government, the powers of the devolved government, the need to, to pursue economic growth through income tax in terms of our devolved tax powers. So, you know, that's why I ask, was there any specific modelling reflecting the, the Scottish position specifically? I mean, we, we have done in various places analysis of how, for example, what would the, be the impacts of salary thresholds in different parts of the UK, including Scotland. Um, we, kind, we, we looked at um, what is the different sort of demographic projections in different parts. I mean, we have not done an assessment of how different migration policies would um, affect the fiscal um, position of the Scottish government um, in, um, specifically, no. Well, that presumably begs the question as to the validity of your conclusions as far as Scotland is concerned, given the key importance of the issues that I've just raised. Um, you mentioned also that perhaps one way to address uh, Scotland's demographic uh, challenges would be to increase the pension age. What, what do you foresee the age being then? Um, we didn't actually propose increases in the state pension age. The only We did show what would happen to, for example, the dependency ratio um, under proposals for increases in the state pension age that already are simply government policy at the moment. So, I mean, at the point we were simply trying to make there was that um, those policies to increase the state pension age that are, are already in place um, are more effective in um, changing the dependency ratio than, uh, than migration. Model beyond age 67 years? Which is what um, the those are the proposals eventually, I think, to write. I think the current ones... I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you the exact dates from this. Are currently for them to rise to 68 um, over quite a long period of time. Um, but if one's looking at projections, sort of 20 years out, which we, we have been doing, or we've just been taking the ONS projections, um, that that is what is currently proposed to happen. I mean, I think um, the, the suggestion that Scotland's demographic challenges could be met by increasing the state pension age to some unspecified age. Uh, has been met uh, really widely across Scotland with some incredulity uh, on the basis that it would be uh, simply unsustainable. But one last question, if I may, uh, convener, I know that many members wish to get in. Um, I think, Professor, you mentioned uh, a, a moment uh, ago in, in response to an earlier uh, uh, questioner uh, that if uh, it were to be considered appropriate to have uh, any regional variation approach, uh, the, the place that you would reflect that would be London and the South East, that that is where it would be appropriate to have a, a differentiated approach. But can I put it to you in light of the questions I've just asked and the answers that you have given, then actually what you have come up with is uh, a policy for London and the South East. Uh, and it does not reflect the interests of uh, Scotland as far as uh, this uh, Parliament is concerned. Um, I don't quite understand why you would, would say that. Could you elaborate a little bit on what, what you think in our proposals does that? Well, uh, you have just accepted that you didn't carry out any specific modelling reflecting uh, uh, the particular position in Scotland, including with regard to the taxation powers that this Parliament currently has. 
uh, and that you did not uh, carry out any specific modelling with regard to that key issue. So I, I suggest, therefore, that uh, uh, absent such uh, an analysis, uh, this report doesn't reflect uh, what we need to see in Scotland. And rather, it seems simply to reflect the interests of uh, elsewhere in the UK, specifically London and the South East. I mean, I wouldn't accept that. I mean, just as we haven't done any specific modelling of the situation in Scotland, we haven't done any specific modelling of the situation in, in London and the South East. And I think when one's talking about the fiscal impacts of the changes that we propose, I would be very surprised if Scotland was very different from the rest of the UK, because its actual economic situation is really quite close to the, to the UK average. So I think I would be wrong to assume that you would get very different answers if you, if you took our proposals about for, on the impacts on the public finances and applied them to Scotland. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ross Greer. Thank you, convener. Um, I have to say at the offset, I've been really frustrated by this debate because it's happening in purely narrow economic terms. And we're not talking about units of labour, we're talking about people who are so much more than their net economic contribution. I'd be interested in what evaluation you've made of the system changes that would be required to implement the policy changes and your recommendations, though. I mean, for example, the changes proposed to Tier 2 are, are quite considerable. It would involve a far, far larger number of people than at present. The Home Office is not famous for its efficiency, its accuracy, the robustness of the systems it currently employs. There are people who wait three years or more for a decision. Did you do any evaluation of how long it would take the Home Office to grow its capacity and change and improve its systems to be able to implement the recommendations? Um, we don't, we don't, we're not as a committee either expert in or generally get involved in the, those sort of operational um, issues. But obviously it would be naive of us to be um, completely um, unaware of them. So we did, um, it, part of our proposal was that the tier two system would, as you say, um, bear a much greater burden under, under, any, under this future system that we propose than, than currently. And there are um, concerns about how fit for purpose some aspects of you know, the operation of the current system um, is. So, I mean, we are very serious about when we say that the Home Office really needs to engage much more with users of the system, which they don't seem to do very much at the moment, to make sure that this is fit for purpose. Um, but our proposals are based on the assumption that the Home Office is capable of operating in a system that is um, efficient, you know, transparent and, uh, and fair. Could you explain a little bit more around uh, what's in your report in regard to the review or analysis that would be required of, of Tier 2? Um, much of, of what you've uh, done um, has resulted in some relatively specific recommendations. There are obviously specific recommendations in relation to Tier 2, uh, but there's also a, a section in your report, I believe, um, around the, the need in response, I think, to a lot of the evidence that was submitted to you, particularly by business, um, to conduct a much more in-depth review or, or analysis of the Tier 2 system. Obviously, on the timescales that we're operating on at the moment, with Brexit itself fast approaching, the transition not lasting that long after that, the challenges of conducting that kind of robust review and then implementing the changes that would be required off the back of it in the time scale uh, that we're currently looking at would be for a department that uh, managed to 60 years on screw up something like the uh, application documents of the Windrush generation it seems to be beyond their capabilities. I mean some of I mean the proposals are for the end of the implementation period. So this is early 2021 at the earliest. So I think there is time, although it is correct to say that the government would need to be coming forward with pretty specific proposals in the not too distant future in order to give business adequate time to plan. But I think some of the proposals that we make, for example, when we say uh, we're not convinced of the resident labor market test um, serves much purpose at the moment, that would simply mean, well, we just remove that from the current um, you know, evidence required. So that isn't something that I think should be would be particularly, um, particularly difficult. So I think there are elements that if one is removing from the existing tier two system, 
um, quite a lot of those sort of requirements, um, that should be relatively easy because it's about stripping out um, bureaucracy rather than adding in a whole set of questions and criteria that people have to satisfy. And just uh, one final question, Convener, if there's time. Um, the evidence that you collected was really robust um, in showing the clear and substantial economic benefits that freedom of movement brings. The policy position of the UK government is obviously to end freedom of movement. Were you able to find or produce any uh, data that shows there being a net economic benefit of ending freedom of movement? Or were you limited in the scope of what you were able to do to try to design a system based on the assumption that policy decision had already been made and try to find something that uh, reduced the, the negative economic impacts as much as possible? I mean, I wouldn't describe our, our, our conclusions as being that freedom of movement has had clear, clear benefits. Our view, you know, it, we looked at a wide range of outcomes, but it's... Sorry to interrupt, but did you find any evidence that freedom of movement has not had clear economic benefits to the UK? Yes, it's had very... I mean, it's had, I think our view was that the effects have been fairly small. There have been neither big costs nor big, nor big benefits. And our view is that if you alter the system, um, you can accentuate the benefits uh, and mitigate the costs. And the issue with freedom of movement is that you, there's really no, no control over the numbers and the mix of migrants who come to the UK. And we think that if you, um, you, know, if you do have some control, for example, on the mix, you make it easier for higher skilled and lower skilled, that that would, would be something that would accentuate the benefits uh, and mitigate the costs. And that kind of you know, proposal that you should have um, migration that's easier for more skilled people. I mean, that's in line with what most other countries, um, you know, Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand um, are doing. They're not choosing uh, freedom of movement because they want to have some control over the, both the numbers and the mix of migrants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Karina, and good morning, Professor Manning. Given the increasingly competitive nature of international students' uh, recruitment, uh, and the decline that we've seen in locations like India uh, coming to the UK, would our post-study work visa scheme not make the UK a more attractive place to come? Um, I think our proposals, I mean, we think that a post-study work visa with sort of unrestricted work rights um, would increase demand for, probably increase demand for um, places in our educational institutions. But we think that demand should be based around the quality of the education offered and the opportunity to move into, into skilled work. So our proposals, while we don't pr propose um, a specific post-study work visa, we did propose extending for masters and PhD students um, the opportunity, the length of time they have to move, find skilled work after completion their studies. And we did propose that the advantages that um, currently students have if they want to move into a tier two work permit um, while they remain in country, that those should be remain up for some years after graduation, even if they lose the UK. So we do think it's important um, to build um, you know, demand for um, our higher education around our work opportunities for, for graduates, but it's important that that's skilled work and not any work. And universities wish to remove students from the net migration target. So why is it the MAC is recommending that students remain within that target? Um, well, we, what we said was that if there's a problem with students in the net migration target, it's a problem with the target itself rather than the inclusion of, net, of students within it. If we removed students from the net migration target, it would require an awful lot of work because we don't have good statistics in particular on student emigration at the moment. And it would make almost no difference to the net migration statistics. And the reason for that is that um, most students leave at their end of their studies. So um, they come in um, and then and they're counted as an immigrant at the moment. They leave, they're counted as an emigrant. If you, um, if, you, if you don't count them in and you, can't, you have to stop counting them out as well, all you do is really alter the timing of when they affect net migration but you have no very, it makes almost no difference to the net migration figures. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Kenneth Gibson. Uh, 
Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Professor. I think one of the reasons why colleagues are concerned about rigid survey <coughs> criteria is because it does give the uh, uh, London a, a, a competitive a, advantage, and so that's obviously been expressed by others. So I won't go into that any further. One thing I would say is, of course, we've never had really completely free movement across the EU because when the accession states came in a, a decade and a half ago, the UK was one of only three countries that didn't actually put barriers against them, as you'll probably recall. Um, now, migration is, of course, a, a two-way street, and I've, I note that in your report you're really focusing on the work route uh, only, which I think is probably uh, a weakness of, 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 the, of the kind of a criteria that were, were set for you. But I'm just wondering, um, you don't see a compelling reason for having different policies for EEA and non-EEA uh, countries uh, in terms of inward uh, migration um, uh, following Brexit. But what would be the impact on UK citizens? going to live, work and study in the EU, if there is no differential, would EU countries then immediately feel obliged to put up barriers uh, against uh, UK citizens? Um, well, I mean, our recommendation um, that um, should be was in for the scenario in which um, the UK immigration has not been part of the negotiations with the EU. And so in some sense, the UK is setting its immigration policy on its own after the end of the implementation period. Um, we didn't make any express any view at all on whether immigration um, should be part of the um, negotiations at all. So I think if one was, you know, the natural place for having some part, some preference for EU citizens in the UK and correspondingly UK citizens in the UK, that would be a part of the negotiations rather than if we ended up at a situation where they had not been part of the negotiations. But I think one of the issues, I mean, you're quite right to say that um, freedom of movement um, is, you know, is a reciprocal right. Um, and so there is a risk that, uh, I mean, that the U UK citizens will lose those rights to, to go to European countries. And I think prior to 2004, um, freedom of movement was more or less not just reciprocal on paper, it was reciprocal in practice, that it was more or less balanced. But I think that um, what happened with, after accession of the Eastern European countries in 2004 is that it became not really reciprocal in, in, in practice. Um, so there were many more uh, people from Eastern Europe who wanted to exercise their treaty rights in the UK than, than UK citizens who wanted to exercise treaty rights in, in Eastern Europe. And that was probably one of the sources of the, the, the concern that people have had about freedom of movement, which didn't, I think, probably was less concern to people before 2004. As I mentioned, only three EU countries did not actually restrict the number of accession state citizens coming in initially, and there was no throwing out of the uh, the whole um, you know freedom of movement policy. And the baby wasn't thrown out with the bathwater. I'm just wondering, you know, it's, see, you've looked obviously at the impact of restricting migration to the UK. But surely there is a quid quo pro. I mean, if if if, our, if we do that, then our citizens may be restricted from going to the to the continent. And I'm just, as I said, what impact would that have economically? I mean, surely that would be a diminishing of both the UK and the remaining EU states. I mean, I think one would have to be realistic. If we did it, if immigration had not been part of, of was, it does not end up as part of the negotiations. And as a result, the UK ends up in a situation where it's setting its immigration policy more or less on its own, you know, as countries like Canada and Australia do, that we would be a third party um, with, a, you know, third party country in the eyes of the other European countries in them in then treating immigration of our citizens in, into their countries. Um, and that would be, um, you know, that would be something to be bear in mind in considering whether immigration should be part of the negotiations. And, and lastly, that would be detrimental or, or, uh, to a considerable number of UK citizens who want to live and work in the European Union, would it not, if these restrictions were therefore imposed upon our citizens? I mean, uh, uh, there would be. Obviously, it's a restriction in choice. I mean, it wouldn't be that unusual. Obviously, Canada you know, and other countries, Australia, restrict the right of our citizens to immigrate to their countries, um, and they don't consult us when they um, when when they make those changes. So, I mean, again, it's not a completely new situation in a global sense. Obviously, it would be new in regard to, to Europe. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. Tavish Scott. Thank you. Uh, professor, professor Manning, I just wanted to understand the arguments that you made at the start about um, the £30,000 salary cap and how that uh, impacts on industries across the whole of the UK who rely heavily on people who p are paid under that amount of money. Is your contention that that's for um, these industries to sort uh, and migration, if I heard you correctly earlier on, migration is absolutely not going to be part of the solution to those problems, those labour shortages? Um, I mean, I think that our, our view is that um, that the migration can solve skill shortages when we're talking about um, jobs that, for example, require sort of skills that require a relatively long training period. But if one's talking about migration as um, a solution to generalise skill shortages, it, it doesn't really solve the problem because it increases... I mean, a, a shortage is essentially labour demand running, running ahead of labour supply. So migration does increase labour supply, but because those migrants also spend money and so on, they also increase labour demand. So it doesn't actually um, solve the problem. I mean, I think our view is that the, you know, since 2004, most EU migration um, was in uh, lower skilled jobs. You know, the average earnings of migrants from the accession states is 30 percent below um, the average. Um, and that, that availability of labour to those lower wage and generally lower productivity sectors um, sort of gave them a tailwind, which, they expand, which has led to, to expansion. But if our vision for, you know, if the vision for Scotland is to make it a sort of a, a high wage, high productivity kind of economy, our view, what we said was, well, it's not obvious that that migration has actually contributed to, to that vision. And a little bit has probably gone in the other direction. I went in uh, Edinburgh here last, uh, let me get this right, Thursday, uh, for the UK hospitality industry. And I sat next to um, a person who owns a hotel in the West Country of England, and I have family down there, uh, and has hotels in Scotland. He told me that they simply can't get staff uh, to do some of the lower wage uh, posts jobs in those hotels uh, without finding people who come from different parts of Europe and who currently work for them. If the salary cap is £30,000, he won't have those people, will he? Uh, unless I'm misunderstanding the proposals that uh, your, your committee are making? I mean, ma many of the jobs in the hospitality would not be eligible under, under our proposals. But the hospitality then. sector has been fantastic in um, creating lots of jobs and quantity of jobs, but it's not been very good in, in creating quality jobs. 95% of jobs in hospitality um, pay below um, average earnings. And, you know, it's not really clear that, you know, this is a set. I mean, obviously, it's an important sector in the West Country and parts of Scotland. No one is saying it isn't going to be. But if you, you want, we want to move towards a high wage, high productivity economy. Um, it's, it's, hospitality isn't uh, as it runs at the moment, which pays really rather low wages, is not obviously a sector that you, you want to enc encourage um, in terms of growth. Um, and, you know, what we've said, what our view is that since 2004, they found it rather easy um, to grow. Um, but our proposal is that it shouldn't, that growth should not be so easy in the future. It's, it's about restricting growth, not sort of getting rid of what there is already. Well, just so I understand it, you're saying the hospitality industry shouldn't grow or the uh, number of people who come in from different parts of Europe shouldn't grow who work in the hospitality industry? I mean, I think that um, every extra job that's in the hospitality industry, on average, makes the UK a lower wage, lower productivity economy. Um, so it's not if you talk about what are the sectors that we want to grow as a share of employment in the UK, you would not be focusing on hospitality um, as one of those sectors. And yet we've had a migration policy since 2004, not by design, but just by sort of accident, really, which has favoured uh, lower, lower wage, lower skill sectors. Um, and, you know, and, you know, what we're saying is, well, we have to sit back and think about really, is that, you know, the way in which we want um, the UK to, to, to go?
But they, I'm a bit puzzled because the tourism is Scotland's biggest industry, and as the hotel owner from the West Country said to me last week, it's the biggest industry in the West Country of England as well. You're, I mean, I don't mean this personally in any sense whatsoever, but your, your analysis there suggests we should give up on tourism. The only people who will be able to afford to stay in hotels are people who can afford presumably £500 a night in the middle of Edinburgh or London, because if your argument follows through to its logical extent, um, everyone's wages will have to go up to a level that they're currently not at. By definition, those businesses will have to push their costs up. By definition, staying overnight will cost a huge amount more. I can't think that's going to do anything other than destroy the tourism industry in the West Country of England. I, I don't think it will d d destroy it. And I think it's important Rich that people. this sector um, competes for labour with other sectors like retail and so on. I mean, many of the jobs that in hospitality um, you know, could potentially be done by people who are not currently working in hospitality. But the problem hospitality is, has is often that it pays very, it pays very low wages. As I said, 95% of the jobs pay below average um, earnings. And so the sector does need a little bit of pressure on it in order, I think, to um, increase its productivity, to provide quality of jobs rather than quantity of jobs. And, um, and, and so by making um, migration harder, not impossible, we're not saying there's no source of labour for these, this sector, um, that that is appropriate nudge for them to go down that route. Have, uh, has this government policy been, to, uh, been given to the owners of the hotel chain who are now hiring out rooms for £19 a night in, in London and Glasgow? Um, well, I think that the, I, I would say we're interested ultimately in providing high quality jobs for UK residents and having a high quality of life for UK residents. I'm not entirely sure if one, I don't know about those hotel chains, but I don't know if one looked at uh, the wages that they're paying their workers, um, whether they're actually contributing to, you know, providing a high quality of life uh, for UK, UK residents. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, following on from um, Tavish Scott's line of questioning um, on tourism, Professor Manning, uh, there's another area of the economy which is also very important to the Scottish economy, uh, which is agriculture. And the National Farmers Union are very concerned about your proposals because 99% of seasonal agriculture workers in the UK are from EU countries and if they don't have access to those workers there's a very real possibility that uh, crops will go unharvested. Um, I was very concerned um, by some of the comments um, made in the past, I believe in your report, uh, where you responded to concerns that um, uh, the seasonal agriculture workers scheme wasn't uh, sufficient to meet the needs of the industry. Um, if I could just quote from your report, you say, while the failure to have some type of seasonal agriculture worker scheme would be bad for the sector, it is a small, low wage, low productivity sector in the wider UK context. So this should not be seen as catastrophic for the economy. And do you think that crops going unharvested is really not catastrophic for the economy? I mean, it, it, it wouldn't be. I mean, for, let me say, first of all, we did propose a seasonal agricultural workers scheme in this for exactly the reasons that you gave, that, 19, that we see close to 100 percent of the work, workers in the seasonal agriculture are currently migrants and that um, and that we don't see any re realistic prospect for that being sourced within the, the resident labour market. Um, but I think that um, I, I, I think that we, what we also said is that one has to recognise that the level of productivity in agriculture as a whole is um, is 40 percent of the national average. Some parts of it are more productive. But it really is a very low productivity sector. And again, it's one of the sectors where one would like them. One doesn't have anything against the sector. We would like them to produce output in a more productive way. So it's not that we want crops to go unharvested. It's that we want them to become a more product productive sector in producing crops. Um, and in doing so, they'll then be able to pay higher wages than they, they currently do. And again, they tend to be a rather low wage uh, sector at the moment. 
Right. Um, just, just to clarify then, if you have said that the, the, the pilot seasonal agricultural worker scheme is not sufficient to recruit the number of workers that they, that they actually need. I mean, from what you seem to be saying, you seem to be saying that in agriculture you want to see uh, some businesses collapsing. You, you believe that they're not productive and you, you would like to see them go to the wall. Um, is that basically what you're saying? No, we would want to see them increase, um, you know, increase their productivity. So we want to see all businesses thrive. But at the end of the day, it's got to be that you, um, you know, you, if you can't be productive enough in order to pay, you know, competitive wages, um, I'm afraid there, there's no business that has the right to be in business at wages that they say that they say they can afford. I'm afraid that is true, not just in agriculture, but but everywhere else. So, I mean, what our proposals are, we, we were that we do recognise that this sector is very dependent on a seasonal agricultural labour. And the pilot is a government proposal. That's not our proposal. And I think the NFU had the concern that it was in the numbers involved were rather small relative to the, the total um, seasonal agricultural workforce. Um, but I mean, I think if one looks at the problems over the last two seasons, that farmers have had in Scotland and the rest of the UK, um, it's important to understand that those have been problems that have occurred without changes to the current migration system at all. It's primarily been driven by the fact that when the pound fell in value after the referendum, um, seasonal agricultural workers suddenly, uh, if they're earning in pounds, their wages have essentially fallen by 15%. They could earn more if they went to Germany or other parts of the Eurozone. Um, and so, you know, those recruitment problems have come about because the sector struggles to compete for labour, in their case, with employ other farmers in other parts of Europe. Not rather make the point that if that's the situation before Brexit has actually happened, it's going to get even worse after Brexit. I mean, the, as we showed in the report, the amount of land that's been planted with quite a lot of the labour intensive crops is increased a lot since 2004. This is one of the sectors that has had a tailwind with a ready availability of lower, um, lower skilled workers prepared to work for lower wages from Eastern Europe. So I think it is possible um, that those, that sector would go, you know, would not expand as fast as it has done over the past 10, 15 years. It's possible even that it contracts a bit, but I think it's important to have a sense of perspective on that. That will be sending the sector back to where it was a few years ago. It's not sort of completely um, destroying a sector, um, you know, uh, like we've never seen before. I think a, a contraction in the food and drink sector in Scotland is acceptable. It's a pr acceptable price of Brexit. I mean, I think you have to... We have a very low unemployment rate, generally, in Scotland, in the UK at the moment. So our problem is not really with the quantity of jobs. It is with the quality of jobs. It's with real wages at the moment. So it's important that the sectors that we really want to grow are the sectors that pay higher wages. We want there to be upward pressure on wages within sectors because those are what determine people's living standards, ultimately. And I think that some of these sectors, um, yes, you know, we do want there to be competition among employers for workers that the workers will then go to the, the employers who can pay them the better wages. And those generally are the more productive workers. That is the mechanism by which we become a more prosperous um, economy and society. Kenneth Gibson. Thanks very much, convener. I mean, to me, this is, uh, this is something that looks as if it's been thought in some kind of laboratory. I mean, if I, I, I get, Ross Gere talked about real people. If I've got a small guest house in the Highlands, you know, someone in my, uh, in, in his mid-50s and he's employing four or five uh, workers and you're trying to compete not just uh, locally but internationally for customers, you know, um, by forcing up wages, making my business uncompetitive, am I going to suddenly be working in the artificial intelligence industry or something? I mean, it's, it, a lot of these people do not have other options. It's, it's simply not the case that the quarter of a million people who work in the Scottish tourism industry or the tens of thousands who work in agriculture can change. And I think it's, it's quite flippant to talk about 
uh, effectively destroying people's livelihoods and businesses by saying we can go back to where we are in 2004. People invested uh, their time, uh, their money, their, their skills, their emotions in building up businesses, and you seem to think, well, you know, at the end of the day, you know, they're not particularly economically productive, so so what? And, and, and you talk about quality of life. If ordinary families can't afford to stay in a hotel because they're no longer uh, uh, competitive and they take their money uh, overseas, how is that helping them, the, U the UK economy, if they're not spending money holidaying in the Highlands or in Cornwall or in Wales? I just don't understand the, 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 the arguments you're actually putting forward, even from an economic perspective. I mean, from an economic <coughs> perspective, we're not saying that, you know, we're saying that those that the employer of that guest house, um, should be competing for workers with all other employers in, in the local economy. And so that, and that is what we think of as, as being, being appropriate. Small um, Highland villages, sorry, sorry, in small Highland villages or in other parts, there may not be these workers. They have to bring them in from elsewhere because there simply isn't enough people available to actually work who have the, the, the aptitude and possibly even the attitude to work in these places. I mean, it's not an easy job working these long shifts in, uh, you know, in hotels, etc., in far-off rural places. A lot of people might want to do a year or two when they're young and then move on to something else in life. But, I mean, if you strangle that opportunity because you're effectively making Scotland and the rest of the UK uncompetitive in the world tourist market, and we've been having an inquiry on that with regard to possibly a tourist tax, then I don't see how, how it helps these communities, I don't, how, it, how it helps individuals, I don't see how it helps business owners at all, I don't think I see how it helps the overall UK economy. Well, I think that the, I mean, those communities often also have a problem with um, retaining, you know, people who grow up there, leaving there and so on. And that's connected to the fact that the, um, you know, the employment opportunities in those areas are often not um, terribly appealing. So I think on the one hand, uh, you know, and that, so that's sort of part of, I think one of the things that those communities should be trying to do, should be trying to use, um, you know, provide higher quality jobs. So it's not just a question of the wages they pay. There's also a question of productivity. There's often a way in which you can think about using your existing employees. And no one here is saying that your existing, you should not be allowed to retain your existing employees. Um, that you know you can use those employees more productively and so on and that is the way the route that we would like to to sort of nudge businesses down because it's ultimately productivity growth which is what leads to rising in rises in living standards and that's ultimately what we what we want to do so no one is really threatening the businesses we're saying that you need you sh we would like those businesses to be less reliant on a continual flow of uh, workers at, at, and in some of them, and I don't know about the specific cases you're talking about, some of them are just at minimum wage, um, and more to think about ways in which they could, you know, have their business thrive without being reliant, so reliant on a sort of continual flow of lower skilled migrants, which they don't manage to seek to retain because those migrants then go on to have better opportunities elsewhere. Thank you. Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I mean, I do understand the argument that we have identified low skill um, and lower wage sectors. Tourism can be um, open to this as well as agriculture. So I understand the desire to increase wages within that sector. I'm just not convinced that cutting off the labour supply is the way to do that. Um, and I wonder if the committee have done any analysis of the impact this would have on particular sectors that members have identified this morning and also where when we've already spoken about Scotland's low birth rate and elderly population we can see other areas across the UK that are facing you've argued similar problems where the workers to replace the um, freedom movement has stopped where the workers to replace those that come from overseas where are they going to come from within the UK economy well I think the first thing is to say that I mean there's the existing stock of people who are already here. So there's no, no one is proposing any change to them that they should be um, moved, you know, so they have settled status and so on. And it's also, even under our proposals, it would not be that one is cutting off the flow of lower skilled migrants completely, because there is always um, a flow through other non-work um, non -work routes. So I think it, we think of it as more accurate to think of... By other non-work routes, I don't... 
you talk sorry, about that would mean something like the family route um, and and so on, asylum routes and things like this. So there are quite a lot of other. So that someone who comes in under the family route, we would see quite a lot, non-trivial numbers actually, working in lower skill, um, lower skill jobs. So what one is doing here is really meaning that the restricting the growth in the labour supply to these sectors. One's not proposing reducing the overall labour supply, it's reducing the growth in the labour supply. And yes, that would put more pressure on these sectors. They have had, a, since 2004, um, growth, has, for quite a lot of them, has been relatively easy. It would be a little bit harder. So we are honest about More than that. a little and we bit do hard, know. I have to... Do you know, I think we're looking at... I mean, people members have described the, the extreme difficulties these sectors will face. I think, you know, and you've also expressed an opinion that we should be looking at restricting growth in these sectors within tourism and agriculture, which I think, you know, is, is astonishing, actually, to make those statements this morning. Well, not growth in... I mean, I think that if you say... You, people, I think, find it very hard to say that they don't... If we ask people, well, what sectors would you like to grow as a share of the economy? Um, people often find those questions very easy to answer. They talk about tech and, you know, sort of high-end manufacturing and, and universities and things like that. But the other side of that coin is that there then have to be some sectors that you say, yes, I'm prepared to see fall as a share of total employment. People find, do find that much harder to talk about because it does mean, um, you know, two people, small business people who've worked, you know, worked very hard on their business sometimes, mean, meaning it's a little bit harder. But I'm afraid I think those are the, the harder decisions that you, that you have to make in some cases. Um, that we have gone down a low wage, low productivity route in the UK as a whole by accident more than design. And the question is whether you want to continue going down that route or whether you want to try and rebalance towards a higher wage, higher productivity economy. And if you do that, you sort of need to, I, th I think our view is you do need to have migrant migration that's easier for higher skilled than lower skilled workers. Um, thank you very much, Professor Manning, for coming to give evidence to us today. Uh, we're now going to suspend briefly uh, to um, have a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Okay, let's move on. Our second item of business today is an evidence session with Creative Scotland and I would like to welcome our witnesses Robert Wilson, the Chair of Creative Scotland and Ian Munro, the Acting Chief Executive of Creative Scotland. Thank you for joining us this morning and I'd like to invite Mr Wilson to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you convener and thank you also to the committee for, for inviting us here to give evidence this morning uh, and for the opportunity to say some opening remarks. Uh, you will have seen our written submission to the committee which provides up-to-date information on a range of topics that has been of interest to the committee over the past year. I hope that you found this useful and both Ian and I will be happy to answer questions on any of these topics or anything else you would like to talk about during this session. <coughs> It has, as you know, been a challenging year for Creative Scotland, but also one where a great deal has been achieved. I joined the organisation as chair in February of this year, and following the departure of the previous chief executive in July, we appointed Ian as acting chief executive, and I'd like to recognise everything that he has done over the recent months. Everyone at Creative Scotland is committed to rebuilding that trust and confidence in our organisation, and we're all working extremely hard to do this, alongside continuing to deliver with care, effective ongoing support of the arts, screen and creative industries in Scotland. We've instigated and delivered some major pieces of work over the past few months, which will help us to achieve this. In July, we commissioned an independent evaluation of the last round of regular funding, the recommendations from which are included in our submission to the committee today. Along with all the other feedback that we have received, this will feed on our broader review of our approach to funding. And we aim to achieve this next year, in which we involve the voices of the people and the organisation that we are here to support. Uh, I have instigated, along with the board and with Ian, a process of organisational development, looking at our structures, our processes, our values and our behaviours, and we are working with a Dundee-based company called Open Change to help us with this process. Significantly, in August we formally launched Screen Scotland, the dedicated partnership initiative that will deliver a true step change for screen support in this country, supported by a £20 million budget from the Scottish Government and the National Lottery. Alongside this, as the newly appointed chair, I have been overwhelmingly impressed with the dedication, the expertise, the commitment and the sheer hard work of our staff that bring to supporting the arts, screen and creative industries on a daily basis. In 2017-18, we made over 1,000 awards to a total of 20, £70 million pounds to artists, creative organisations and projects across Scotland. All of this makes a positive and continued difference to the people's lives in Scotland. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone whose work continues to drive the extraordinary cultural landscape that is Scotland. I look forward to this morning's discussions, and thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, um, Mr Wilson. Uh, can, I, can I start by asking you about your organisational review? I'm keen to get a little bit more uh, detail about that. Um, why did you decide to embark on the organisational review? Well, as I say, said in my opening remarks, um, this has, has been a challenging time for, for Creative Scotland. And when I came in, it became clear that there were some fundamental changes that we needed to, to instigate. Uh, this is an extremely impressive organization, but clearly there are aspects of it that need to be improved. And the way I've seen organizations in the past, that this is a perfect time to look at an organization, to see where the strengths, where the weaknesses are, and see if, how we can improve and move on in a much stronger way. Okay. Um, can I ask which independent consultant has been appointed to support the organisational review? Uh, it's a company called Open Change in Dundee. Uh, now, they have, they've had a very strong track record. They, they, they work very closely with um, Historic Environment Scotland, 
and we were impressed. We went through a very rigorous recruitment process, um, and we were very impressed with what with the approach they were going to be taking, uh, and they will be working with us over the next six months. Right, okay. And you, you also state in your response to the 31st of August that you're also reviewing the open project uh, funding. Is it the same company that's involved in that? Well, that is actually a, a separate uh, a separate review. Right. Maybe, and you'd like to talk on that. So one. we're making some internal refinements on the existing funding um, uh, processes, particularly on the, on the open project fund and the small scale uh, grants uh, strand of that under 15,000. But that's not intended to be um, uh, the, big, the bigger and fuller funding review that we are planning um, for all of our routes to funding, which will take place over the next few months um, and variously involve not just the staff, but um, the applicant organisations and uh, the, the sector's uh, representatives who have a chance to feed that review and um, explain their expectations and, and needs um, to help us finalise what that funding model, uh, which is more effective for the future, looks like. That would be a review of both your regular funding and your open project funding. It would be a review of all your funding streams, so you could basically completely change the whole structure of your funding potentially as a result of that review? Yeah, we're taking stock of all of them. So regular funding, open project funding, and our third route funding, which is targeted funding, which is time-limited strategic funds. Um, what's really important is that we understand what the most effective balance of um, those kind of three types of funding are for the organisation going forward, as well as the detail of how the processes themselves actually work. Okay. Both in terms of this overall funding review and the organisational review, could you tell us a little bit more about how you intend to consult stakeholders in terms of both those reviews? So on the funding review, um, which is a complementary piece of work to the organisational uh, development process, um, we're planning to take a five-stepped uh, approach to that. What we've already got and what the, the sector have told us uh, innumerable times is that they feel consulted out. So what we're doing at the moment is really taking stock of all the information that we've already got available in the first instance, so including the evidence that was given to the committee um, in the regular funding inquiry. The Wavehill uh, evaluation report, which is the independent um, evaluation of the regular funding process this year. Um, as well as uh, horizon scanning to look at um, international examples of different kinds of funding models. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, assimilate all of that information and reflect on it and then um, take that out for concert, uh, consultation and co uh, conversation with the sector in a variety of different ways, online and indeed in kind of group sessions that we'll be planning in the early part of next year. Okay. That will all give, a, uh, give us all the opportunity to understand not just what the needs are but what the best models might be um, and what we will do thereafter is to refine that uh, propose some models again test that with um, representatives from the, the staff in the sector um, before we finalize that model and uh, then look towards the implementation period and of course when we understand that this is quite broad in its scope um, we will have to have a, some form of transition between one model and the next. And we'll need to handle that very, very carefully and we're sensitive to ensuring that we have a continuous offer there that works for people in the sector whilst we move to a, a different, more effective model. I think we would anticipate um, overall that we will still have some form of mix of regular funding in some way, shape or form coupled with project-based funding in some way, shape or form, coupled with strategic targeted funding. But as I said uh, earlier, I think it's the, it's the balance across all three of those and understanding the dynamic and the complementarity of them that uh, we'll be taking stock of as well as the, the detailed processes. You said in your submission that you had been talking to the Arts Council in England and other, I think, Wales um, as well. Uh, have you looked further afield at different models? This initial scoping work will be um, examining those international uh, models as well. I think we want to have further conversations with um, Arts Council England and, and Wales, but, but also in, in an international context, if there's anything um, significant of interest, of course, we will want to uh, have those conversations too.
this will all be wrapped up in a, in a, in a piece of work, a report, that then will go out to consultation. Is that what you said? Just what, what the form of that is, won't, I, I can't be absolutely sure yet, but it will, it will be some form of documentation that we're able to, um, to take for conversations with people in a, in a transparent way. I think it's fundamental that we're able to explain the steps of the journey that we're going on and afford people the opportunity to feed that conversation about what's best. You're aware that obviously that one of the uh, one of the strong um, arguments that came out uh, from from the sector uh, as a result of our committee's scrutiny was that um, sectoral organisations were competing with artists uh, for funding, uh, and and over and above that, there is a frustration um, amongst artists that the the current system of funding uh, doesn't really leave them many opportunities compared to the old system under the Arts Council, which gave smaller grants for artists. Is that something that you're giving quite a lot of attention to in this current piece of work that you're doing? We absolutely will be, and that's my point about the kind of balance of, uh, of the kind of routes to funding and how they work most effectively. I think the, the point about the sector development organisations is um, absolutely understood. I think it's worth recognising that we, when we ran the first regular funding process in 2015, for the 2015 to 18 portfolio, um, sector development organisations were included as part of that process. Um, what we did in the event of decision making was to recognise that tension, which has been described again, between those organisations that produce and present work and those organisations that are, are kind of sector development in the broadest sense. Although we should also recognise that um, there are several organisations in um, the, the network which do both um, uh, themselves. So, um, but at the point in that first round, when everybody was included, what we did was to separate out um, the network, the separate secret, uh, sector development organisations. Um, but the, the numbers are almost identical. Um, in that 15 to 18 period, we had 123 organisations, which comprised 118 regularly funded organisations and five sector development organisations, to a value of £102 million. This time, we've got 121 organisations to the value of £102 million. So they're almost identical, but I, I accept the point about the tension uh, in the nature of a competitive process about the, the dynamic of that. I think what I'm getting at is almost a more fundamental point, and that you hear it time and time again, is that you know, in terms of public money, there's a lot of public money going to support art, art administrators, management, um, whereas artists themselves are left to struggle from one small grant to the next and just scrabble around uh, wherever they can, they can get it. That's the fundamental the challenge is it, do you agree with that yeah absolutely recognize that and i think i mean two points on that one is i think most people would recognize the value that sector development organizations have overall but it is that tension um, with those who are the creators producers and presenters of that work and i think it's partly why we're, we're currently focused on on a refinement to the under fifteen thousand pounds um, open project fund um, in order to ensure that we're um, targeting uh, through that single mechanism, uh, support for individual artists. We just made an announcement um, yesterday about the latest round of open project funding. And what you'll see is nearly a million pounds of awards there to 44 uh, individual grants, the majority of which are to individual artists. And uh, you know, so it's still a strong component part of what we're able to offer. But there are, um, I don't think we should uh, overlook the fact that actually funding for regularly funded organisations them, uh, themselves or indeed through other targeted funds do also offer opportunities for individual artists to, uh, um, to be employed and, and produce their work. I mean, our latest statistics from 2016-17, uh, I think, uh, demonstrate that there's something like uh, 4,500 individual artists employment opportunities for um, the 121 RFOs that were funded in that period. So, but you obviously accept that you know there is discontent and that you need to do yes. more. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, so there are a number of reviews on going at the moment, and the committee was um, prompted in the summer earlier this year to undertake an inquiry after the concerns were expressed to us around the regular funding decisions. Uh, so the reviews you're undertaking at the moment, you've described a number of them this morning. Um, 
Obviously, Ian Munro is here as the acting chief executive. Can I ask when is there a time score or decisions made about the appointment of a chief executive? And are you comfortable moving forward with the, the depth of the inquiries we have at the moment without a permanent chief executive in post? Yes, I mean, <clears throat> the organisational change uh, review, which is very much the, the bit that I'm, I'm championing on, uh, as I said earlier, there is a time in an organisation where this type of review is absolutely crucial. And we felt that, having discussed it with the board, uh, that we needed to push on with that sort of review. You know, the recruitment process of a new chief executive would probably take six to nine months, and then the, the new person would then have to get themselves fully under their feet under the desk. Um, the board also has um, a lot of confidence in, in, in the acting chief executive to be able to drive this change. But I, I also set up a very small board subcommittee of four members of the board to drive this change agenda. It's a very deep and far-reaching uh, review uh, and one which will also have a strong external focus. Uh, open change, again, part of their, the reason for their selection was how they have worked very strongly with external stakeholders to sort of cast a light into our organisation. But I think there was very much a sense that we had to keep the, the momentum for change moving forward. It's probably too early. I don't know if you're able to comment on the organisational review and, and the role of open change, because I'm assuming that the organisational review will be considering the role of the chief executive and whether there's been any concerns, not about the individual, but about the role of the chief executive and the, the statutory status of Creative Scotland, if that's been, if that will be considered by the organisational review? Well, the organisational review, we, we've, we've just started that process. In fact, we've had about, they were appointed in October. And I think it, it, it's, it's really too early at this stage to describe the, the full extent of, of, of how far that review will be going. Uh, but I think what you should be rest assured is that it is seen as a really very, very important priority that the strengths of this organisation are are clearly enunciated, but also where there have been weaknesses in the past, we have to try and resolve those and to find a way of moving forward as a much more fit and able organisation. Um, can I ask about the Wave Hill review of the 2018-21 funding, which probably, you might argue it wasn't a response to our inquiry, but it timed along with our in inquiry. Um, is that, when, when's, the, when's that due to be concluded? Because the committee have received a number of papers from Creative Scotland that quotes from the Wave Hill review, but we don't actually have a finalised, is there a finalised copy of it? And so what's the status of that review at the moment? Uh, it's not available yet, but if I, can, I can just explain because uh, we did actually commission in the previous RFO process as well a, a similar piece of work, but the significance and importance and uh, value of this piece of work, I think is what we've recognised. So we, we commissioned it originally in July, uh, it was quite an ambitious timescale. It was kind of seven-week turnaround, and it involved consultation with staff and uh, the leadership of the organisation, including the board, as well as all of the individual applicant organisations. And we had, uh, on this occasion, we had 105 of the 184 applicant organisations respond to that. And some, uh, some of that was followed up in detailed uh, conversations between the consultants and the the individual applicant organisations. Um, what uh, we observed when we got into it was that actually there was an opportunity there to get even greater value from that piece of work. As I said, the context for this and the value for this was um, uh, the ability for it to play quite powerfully into these reviews that we were uh, planning to undertake, including that wider funding review that I spoke about. So what we did was to extend that process with the independent um, uh, evaluators to give them the opportunity to look e um, even more extensively at the material, the analysis and so on and that stretched over into September and the report um, concluded mid-October which is what we've shared with you in terms of the recommendations and the, the evidence that we've given you. It's really important though at this stage that because that um, is such an important piece of work and covers um, quite testing and um, uh, challenging ground for the organisation. It was a bruising experience, including for staff. I'm very sensitive to that in, in terms of supporting the staff to really take time to understand that report, 
um, the issues that it's discussing and the recommendations that it's making um, and get people comfortable with it um, before we share it in, in, uh, in due course. And I would anticipate that we'll be in a position to do that over the, to do that over the next few weeks. Okay, thank you. And one final question. The, um, so the reviews that are ongoing at the moment, there are a number of reviews, and you said that you, I think, recently announced some open funding awards. Um, does that mean you don't expect the reviews that are ongoing to have any impact on upcoming awards? Or for, uh, are stakeholders quite clear about the current awards that are available, that they might change, or what the timescales for any changes might be? Or? We know we've got some communication to do now, as we uh, internally as well as externally, about how these reviews are dovetailing and, um, and will move forward. Some of the next steps are only possible to know once you've gone through one stage of it. So what will be important is that ongoing communication. Um, in the meantime, though, I think it's really important for people to know and understand that there is ongoing business delivery and um, the opportunities um, for people to access support in, in, in development terms, not just in funding terms, will continue. We're not going to disrupt the current offer in terms of the three routes to funding, we will continue to um, deliver those three uh, as planned and as communicated. But as we, as we do move forward into uh, the prospect of new models and then in due course, the actual new models themselves, we'll be very clear about how we're going to navigate that and be, uh, be communicating that very clearly so that people can understand how they can access support, but also what's coming next. Because I'm sure you recognise how important that is, given one of the issues we had over the summer was the Turing Fund, the way in which that was announced and people not being aware of the changes and it being announced at the same time as regular funding, it just been confusion around that about how important it is going forward yeah. to make it much clearer to people where changes are expected to be coming along. Yeah. Um, and the Turing Fund, uh, fund um, you know, we, re we recognise that you know, a different approach would have been better. But since um, we've engaged with the theatre and, and dance sector and uh, FST uh, themselves um, proactively and collaboratively, they've helped shape what the Turing Fund has, uh, has been launched as in August of this year. Um, and indeed, uh, that will continue because we're currently recruiting um, independent uh, sector representatives to be part of the panel that makes decisions on those awards. Um, and we're also, um, the deadline for the applications is uh, next week and we've already seen some applications coming through for that. But that, that um, will continue, we've committed in, in the published guidance that we will reflect on the experience of all of that in terms of future iterations of the Turing Fund and adjust that as necessary as informed by the, by the sector themselves. So they've had direct input in a very helpful way and I think it's a, it's a helpful model. Thank you. Thanks very much. Did you have a supplementary, Kenneth? Yeah. About funding, actually, convener. Thanks, if that's yeah. okay. I mean, I mean, you have mentioned, I'll, I'll talked a lot about it. Um, you've talked about, for example, the balance of funding. But when I look at page eight of your submission, and we look at the geographic uh, funding distribution for regular open project and target funding, I notice the area I represent, North Ayrshire, uh, the grants of 100, just over 192,000 pounds in year 16-17 uh, were only 1% of the £19 million that Glasgow got. So Glasgow has got four times the population of North Ayrshire, but it's 100 times the number of grant awards. And if you look at the two Scottish uh, largest cities, Edinburgh and Glasgow, they get 60% of the number of grants and 60% of the total uh, funding, over £40 million out of £66 million. So I'm just wondering what, what, what Creative Scotland will do to try and encourage more applications from organisations and groups out with uh, the big cities to, to ensure there's a much more even distribution of funding and to try and support and stimulate arts groups and individuals uh, in those areas. I, th I think, to be fair, there'll always be a disproportionate a grant award in Edinburgh and Glasgow for obvious reasons. You know, they're kind of magnets for, 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 for people um, of an artistic bent. But, you know, 25 times a per capita grant award seems to me shockingly disproportionate and uh, it's not just of course North Ayrshire there's many other areas in Scotland Western Bartonshire, Clackmannanshire, uh, Falkirk for example also seem to have very low levels of applications awards and uh, I, I just want to know what can be done to rebalance on that or, or? I, I can understand yeah I can understand um, absolutely that that uh, perspective and, and we're absolutely committed to ensure that we are able to support activity and work and individuals and organisations across the length and breadth of Scotland. Um, I'll come to the specifics of that in a, in a second, but in, just in terms of the wider context, it is quite a complex dynamic 
um, um, that is in place here. Um, but I think we should uh, see that, you know, for example, the work of the regularly funded organisations are captured in terms of the geographic base location of those organisations, but of the 121 that we are supporting in this next three-year period, 74% um, of their, them and their work takes place across the whole of the uh, geography of Scotland. So there's a distinction there between where they are geographically based, and, and that's important, but also where the, where the work and the activity itself actually happens. Um, we also have national programmes that, that, uh, that we work on, things like the Youth Music Initiative. You know, there's nearly a quarter of a million um, school children have, and, and young people have been involved in activity in, in the most recent year for that across uh, all 32 local authorities. Um, but the, the, to get to the heart of your question, I think in terms of recognising what, uh, what the data and the statistics tell us and... Um, addressing that, one of the most important interventions that we've been undertaking over recent years is um, around place partnerships, um, which is about um, working hand in hand with local partners and um, the sector in the local area to build that capacity and that confidence, understand what the aspiration and ambition is and look at how we can uh, work together in order to um, support that in some way, shape or form. It's not really about project funding at that point, although some of that does take place, but it's about understanding what strategically might be the big shifts that could take place in a local area that will help build that confidence uh, uh, and that capacity and, and deliver the ambition. And what we do is to co-invest with local partners in that area over a, a number of years. Um, now, in earlier years in, in, in that programme, what we've had is an approach which is... Um, uh, changing now in favour of uh, understanding where there's a real opportunity to step in to an area of, of, of uh, kind of lower spend um, in order to uh, work together effectively, whereas previously it had been um, more about where there was a kind of willingness um, and, a, and a kind of positive opportunity. I think what we're uh, keen to do is to build our own kind of geographical presence as part of that equation. Um, in terms of how we operate across uh, the geography of Scotland. Our staff are out and about for a variety of reasons right across um, Scotland um, for different reasons, but I think we can do more of that, and I think that will be something that we'll reflect on too as part of the, um, the reviews that we're going to be going through. Thanks, and just, just one final question. Just um, Obviously, a lot of these areas that are not getting a lot of funding are, are, are fairly uh, uh, deprived, so additional funding, I'm sure, would be... Uh, it would be uh, particularly important. But in five years from now, do you think we'll see a significant difference to this? Yes. Figures? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's already um, evident in the way that we've seen. Uh, so we've got currently 14 live place partnership uh, partnerships across Scotland. Um, and there will be more to come. The newest one is in Angus. And they'll cover um, the whole country? Yeah. Eventually, they will cover the whole, the whole country. We've, we've done 16 so far. Two, mm. two have completed, another couple are about to complete, and um, 14 are currently live, and we'll continue to build on that. Eventually, we'll have covered the whole uh, of the geography of Scotland. Um, and, and I'm absolutely confident that we will see the picture um, improve. Yeah. Okay, thank, thanks, Convener. Yeah, I, I could just comment that during, during the inquiries, uh, the committee's inquiry into regular funding, uh, you know, was commented that if the place partnerships, who ha which have been in place for some time, were supposed to build capacity in, in different parts of Scotland, so that you would see regular funding going to organisations in those parts of Scotland, and that didn't happen in the last round. But I'm pleased to hear you saying that you're you're pleased that it's going to happen. You believe it will happen in future. Yes, you know, yeah. and we will be committed to ensuring that we, that we afford every opportunity. I mean, I think, obviously, those reg the regular funding process, in whatever form in, in, in the future, will um, will yeah. reflect on, yeah. on this Because obviously, when you've it. got two million for the Fruit Market Gallery in Edinburgh and nothing in Ayrshire, that's a problem, isn't it? Yeah. Well, only if you look through that one singular kind of route to funding and that one lens. But I accept the point that, that of course, there is m much more to be done to ensure that we... Um, can see funding and investment across the whole of the geography of Scotland. Thanks very much. Ross Greer. Thank you, Convener. Um, I've just got two brief questions, two 
brief request for reassurance, really. The first is around the issues that we had with um, factual inaccuracies in the 2018 to 21 um, session. In the, the last session we had on this, Ben Thompson, who was then the, the interim chair, uh, said in direct response to my question on this, uh, the board was unaware of any factual inaccuracies. Now, I've since been informed by um, Fire Exit that that was not the case, that individual board members were emailed and informed um, and other, otherwise informed uh, about factual inaccuracies. Um, and I'm not asking you to uh, respond um, or update on uh, Mr. Thompson's question. Uh, what I'm asking for is reassurance that the issues with uh, the factual inaccuracies, but also the issue of organisations feeling that they were unable to have those addressed during the process, are being taken into consideration in the process that you now have going forward. Yes, I would give you that assurance. I mean, I think um, we take the feedback very seriously, and some of this is reflected in the, the Wavehill RFO evaluation. Um, I think just to be absolutely clear, and, and we have put this in, in the written evidence previously at the end of August, that um, uh, at the timing of that exchange um, in the previous committee evidence session was at a certain moment in time. What we've subsequently had is the kind of eight uh, formal uh, complaint process investigations that looked at the detail of all of this and in two instances we find that there were there were uh, matters of significance within it which uh, we've communicated fully back to all of the com uh, complaint organizations um, we've not had any direct follow-up or challenge in response to that but in the event um, of all of those the the instances of, of complaint uh, those organizations were recommended for support Anyway, um, but we do ex uh, accept that you know it's really important that our kind of the quality of uh, the work that we do uh, is transparent and accountable and can be explained to people so that they've got full trust and confidence in the processes that we run, whilst they might not always agree with the outcome and, and the decision. That's reassuring. Just to, to pick up on one thing you mentioned there about the organisations where those issues were raised did in the end re receive funding. FireX also mentioned that three years previously, in the previous round, they had raised concerns about factual inaccuracies and were essentially told not to worry about it because they were getting their funding anyway. Um, that is not a good reason um, to cease worrying about factual inaccuracies in the reports. Of course, I'm quite sure they and others were delighted to receive their funding in the end doesn't resolve the issues of stress, anxiety, everything yes. that went with that process. So that, that does need addressed. The second point that I'd like some reassurance on is uh, in the recommendations for the five stages of the process going forward, uh, there's one particular recommendation. Um, future guidance documentation for applicants should consider outlining expectations of what constitutes acceptable conduct following any announcement of funding awards. Now, given the very public uh, negative statements made by a number of applicants off the back of this last process. I'd also like your reassurance that the purpose of this recommendation is not to restrict applicants' ability to conduct discourse in the public realm if they feel it is necessary. Of course, uh, you know, we would never in inhibit that. I think what we're on a journey towards is, is greater trust um, and confidence in the work that we do and a, and a greater sense of transparency and accountability that um, can stand up to scrutiny. That must be at the heart of our work as a, as a kind of public organisation. Um, I would give you assurance about that. Uh, this is an independent evaluation mm. and I want to be clear that this is the independent findings and recommendations of that, that um, analysis uh, uh, work that has been undertaken by Wavehill Consulting. Um, I think it's important to record that it's been a time of anxiety and frustration and anger. Um, I absolutely see and hear and understand that. It's also worth recognising it's been a very bruising experience for the staff of Creative Scotland too, um, who, as you heard from Robert earlier, are very committed to what they do and, and do that with such diligence and care. Um, we have had instances of what I would consider unacceptable behaviour for anybody in any um, form of public life, um, which has strayed into in, in, indeed people individually um, as staff members of Creative Scotland being um, abused in, in a very open public environment, so not even in a closed setting, which in itself would be a, a kind of problem. I think we, we have a, a kind of set of standards in, 
in the way that we operate, which uh, I think we would want to ensure was going to reciprocate it um, with the sector in terms of uh, trust and confidence, but also kind of mutual respect. And I think whilst we might not always agree, the, the business of Creative Scotland is absolutely delivered by people and people are at the heart of it. So, you know, I think discussion and debate and dialogue and sometimes disagreement is at the heart of it. But, um, but it's built on people and those relationships. And I think we, we uh, want to make sure that we've kind of got a, a mutually respectful relationship there. The recommendations in relation to protecting Creative Scotland staff during future processes, I think, are particularly welcome ones. So I think we as a committee would be interested in how they are fleshed out in the future. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Annabelle Ewing. Hey, thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, just picking up on Kenneth Gibson's uh, point, I represent, uh, proud to represent Cowton Beath constituency, and I would be very keen indeed to see uh, the sort of nascent cultural activities in some areas being encouraged and facilitated, and I will be looking at future developments in that regard very closely indeed, because I think it's very important that we recognise that right across Scotland, people are, are desperate to uh, participate and contribute to the cultural side of life, and I think they should be encouraged uh, in all ways. Um, picking up on the, the Wakefield report, I mean, it is a pity, I have to say, that it was not available in the public domain in advance of your coming to the committee today, because perhaps we could have had a, a more meaningful discussion in terms of the, the specifics that are in that report that we've not really been able to, to, to get a handle on thus far, but doubtless there will be a further opportunity when the report is finally published. Um, looking at the, 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 the sort of top line issues, I appreciate there's all these reviews ongoing and so forth, but the top line issues, I mean, obviously the, the funding situation in, uh, earlier this year was not ideal to say the least. And, and I just wonder already, you know, absent the conclusions of these ongoing reviews, what, what top line lessons do you think have been learned uh, by Creative Scotland further to the kind of situation that pertained yeah. earlier this year? I mean, we've touched on some of the themes in, in a variety of um, ways already this morning. I mean, I think, you know, trust and confidence comes in many different ways. Um, the lessons to be learned are about greater engagement and transparency, um, about clearer um, descriptions of what and why um, and how we work. Um, all of these will be important conversations as part of the reviews that we have with people. Um, I think the organisation, in the brief, that it, the breadth of the brief that it holds, um, is at risk of um, tying itself in knots, trying to be all things to all people all of the time. And I think I think a, a greater sense of clarity about who we're here for, what we're here for, and how we do it is part of what these reviews will help us to, uh, to deliver. I have to say that also part of this equation is that we know, um, and it's very unsatisfying from our perspective too, but we know um, as part of all of this equation that um, whilst we have a very supportive Scottish Government and a very supportive um, Cabinet Secretary, and um, you know, they, they absolutely are, uh, uh, understand the importance of culture, our overall budgets are, are in themselves limited, and that's always going to be the case. But if I take a couple of examples, open project funding, we're only able to support, it fluctuates between a third and a quarter of all the applications that, um, that come forward. We could support many, many more. Um, but regular funding is an interesting case in point because we had 184 applicant organisations. Um, 160 of them were recommended for support to the value of £140 million. The 121 that we ended up funding um, uh, could have been supported at their level of request, £123 million. So our overall budget, which uh, comprises both grant and aid and um, the national lottery, um, has two component parts, roughly two-thirds grant and aid, one-third national lottery. The grant and aid part of it represents 0.2% of the overall Scottish Government budget. Um, we know that we could uh, see an absolute transformational step change with just a, a wee bit more money within the, the equation. And I think this is also in the context of the landscape in which um, uh, cultural organisations and individual artists and practitioners are operating, because that landscape is contracting. There are pressures on public funding. There are pressures uh, on uh, 
trust in the foundation funding, uh, private giving, philanthropy, and so on. And it throws into even sharper relief um, an expectation on Creative Scotland to be able to uh, compensate for that in some way, shape, or form. So I think the overall budgets that we have at our disposal are part of this equation in terms of how we can be clearer on the one hand about what our priorities are and how we operate, um, but also um, not ever um, stepping back from championing and advocating for um, uh, further resources from whatever uh, sources in order to enhance the opportunities for people to present their work. Um, well, thank you for that. But I mean, obviously, in terms of uh, this year's uh, budgetary settlement, I do remember colleagues uh, were really quite... Um, um, uh, uh, please, indeed, uh, this tremendous settlement that the Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop actually managed to secure. I think probably other portfolios were looking on with some uh, some jealousy, perhaps, um, at the fantastic settlement that uh, Fiona Hislop managed to secure. Um, I mean, obviously, in terms of resources, further budgetary discussions will take place. I, I guess that one always has to be confident in terms of allocation of, of money that is the public money, taxpayers' money. Uh, that it is well spent, and that brings us back to your organisational review, ensuring that you do everything that you can to ensure that any public money you get is going to be properly spent and discharge your obligations uh, to the public at large. In terms of the reviews, what will the specific remits of these reviews be in the public domain so the, the public can understand mm -hmm. what exactly the review is tasked to, to do? Yes, we we'll, uh, acknowledged earlier to Claire Baker's question about um, these reviews and the communications of this is going to be an important. So yes, we want to be very clear about the what remit. these are uh -huh. um, and how they're intended to operate, timescales as we go through them, and then ongoing kind of progress against them. So that, Because they are complementary and they dovetail, and I can appreciate that that's quite a, uh, um, a complex um, equation to, to understand if you're not in the heart of it like we are. So we'll ensure that we're, we're producing as effective communications as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, on the budget, though, Sorry, can I... The... Apologies. Uh, just on that point, uh, apologies, Ms. Ewing. How will you communicate that to this committee, the, the, um, the progress of these reviews and indeed the outcomes of these reviews? We'll be happy to give the committee um, further written uh, updates of progress as we move through the next yeah, few months into next year. If you could, that would, that yep. would be good. Sorry, Ms. No, Ewing. That, that's, that. you were going on to, I think, deal last Yeah, I was just on, on, uh, on that budget point. You know, I, I said as part of my answer, we absolutely... Um, applaud the Scottish Government and the, the Cabinet Secretary for the support that we've experienced and it, and it was um, a settlement that we're very much um, w that we very much welcome still um, and part of that was around the, the drop in challenges to the national lottery income. Um, what I'm saying though is that in, in constrained uh, budgets which th there will always be, we know that there is so much more quality and ambition that could be supported um, for um, where enhanced resources to be available. And we would, we would want to continue to advocate for that. The regular funding um, of 121 organisations takes up about 85% or so of our grant and aid budget. That's quite a significant component of available resources through that one funding stream for 121 organisations. And it therefore limits um, the, the remainder of grant and aid in terms of what's possible with it, but it also throws emphasis onto the National Lottery income stream which we've got, which is around a third of our budget, which has continued to be under challenge, although is, um, is kind of stabilising now. But that, that has dropped nearly a quarter in the last four years. And this is where the, the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government were able to address that. But, you know, that challenge remains very live for us in terms of the National Lottery perspective. And, and we are working very hard with the wider National Lottery family, which is all the distributors across the UK, and with Camelot, the, the National Lottery operator, and with the DCMS and the Gambling Commission to ensure that the importance and value of the National Lottery to the, the life of the nation is... Um, is pre uh, preeminent so that that converts those good causes into ticket sales which flow back into uh, the distribution of funding that is available to us okay thank you okay thank you alexander stewart thank you Kimina. we've talked this morning and, and you've acknowledged the the challenges you've had the difficulties uh, the confidence uh, all of that uh, and you've given us a, an insight as to how you're trying to manage that situation going forward uh, and i think that the, the dialogue uh, the transparency, the openness that you've uh, given us this, this morning gives us an insight as to 
uh, your, your outlook of trying to secure that and, and increase that. Uh, but the communications that you need needs to be robust because you must have suffered some sort of reputational damage in the sector uh, and in the public eye throughout all of the situation that you find yourselves in. Uh, and by putting forward the policies and by putting forward some of the procedures you want to enhance, uh, that may alleviate that. Uh, but in the long term, uh, you, you, you have to rebuild that confidence uh, to ensure that there's the, the opposition. And, and so, so can I ask, in doing all of that, uh, we, we've talked about the budget and resources being available, uh, and you're having to do, as everyone else says, yes, uh, uh, more with less resources than you would want. How do you prioritise to ensure that that reputation is rebuilt? Mm. I think we should, uh, uh, having acknowledged all of that as we have done earlier, I think we should also recognise, and it was, it was mentioned in, in Robert's opening remarks, that um, the organisation is not fundamentally broken. There are many positive things um, that our, our organisation continues to support and enable uh, and deliver. And we have many positive relationships with uh, people in the sector, be they as indiv individuals or organisations or indeed with partners and stakeholders. I think I mentioned earlier that at the heart of this really is the, uh, the human relationships that we have with people. It's fundamental. We have very many positive relationships, uh, uh, as I've said. And um, if we can continue to ensure that we are connected with people um, across the geography of Scotland, hearing uh, their concerns, but also their, their ambitions and, and on the odd occasion, some positive feedback, it helps inform how we, how we work, what our priorities are and how we can um, explain and account for ourselves. But it also helps us um, refine our processes and so on to ensure that we are um, continuously learning and, um, and improving as we as we go. What these reviews are about are kind of taking quite a comprehensive stock of the situation um, across a whole range of areas to um, to reset the organisation. But that's not a, you know that's not a blank sheet of paper, and I wouldn't want us to uh, to overlook the fact that, that we do have some uh, very positive things that we're doing. But at the heart of it are people, and I think being engaged with people on discussion and debate and dialogue and, uh, and so on is, uh, is very important to us. And the, the wealth of talent that is in the sector uh, is continuing to grow and continuing to expand their ambitions and their abilities to try and communicate all their creativity across the sector. Uh, and you have a very big role within that to promote and to ensure that the ones who are trying to move forward get the chance and get the opportunity. And that's through the funding that you may require and they may require to ensure that they have that opportunity to expand their horizons. Uh, so in doing all of that, and you've touched on partnership working today, and I think that is very crucial to ensuring that you have the success that you're trying to achieve. Uh, but, there, but there will be, uh, and there are, as we've already seen, locations across the country that are stifled uh, from that debate and from that discussion because they do not have uh, the opportunities and the wherewithal for that to happen. You have a key role to it, ensure that that does now, you break down some of those barriers and that you do give them the chance to, to develop and progress uh, and, and, and see their ambitions being realized. Uh, but that, that is a very difficult thing to achieve in a very short space of time. So can I ask, when you do have these reviews, how, how, was, how will that be fed into it to ensure that we can see for ourselves here at this committee, but for also the general public and the wider sector to see that there is progress and there is a, a movement uh, of progression for the organisation. I think what's important about what you've said is um, uh, that our relationships with people um, are not just about funding. It's also about development and advocacy and influencing. I think there's much expectation on Creative Scotland uh, as a national body. But what I'm keen we do as the organisation uh, moving forward is that we're, we're in partnership rather than some sort of kind of parental relationship with individuals and the sector. It's much more kind of peer-to-peer. -peer. And what the place partnership examples demonstrate is, is that in that peer-to-peer -peer relationship, we are... <coughs> We are working together with the relevant people and partners in individual areas um, in a respectful way that is empowering 
in that local area of those individuals and, and organisations and we find uh, opportunities to understand where we might be able to provide development support through expertise and knowledge that we hold or um, uh, or the ability to uh, invest through some funding if that's appropriate too um, as well as um, in partnership with those in the local area talk to others who may not be quite as much on the same page in terms of the value and, and opportunity and contribution that culture and creativity can actually have to the area um, and be shoulder to shoulder um, uh, advocating for that and trying to influence people we also the the youth is very very important uh, and i think we are doing a huge thing with time to shine and our national youth advisory group where we're trying to get the young from sort of 16 upwards to really engage and, and again Touching on your point, it, it's often if you can get the youth involved at a very early age that you have this potential transformational um, potential. And that, that's a very, very important part of what we're doing as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if I just pick up on um, when Alexander Stewart was talking about your reviews, and I do appreciate that you've said that you will keep the committee informed. I think it would be useful in the first instance to, to, for you in writing um, uh, to tell the committee what the, the sequence and what the, the timetable of the different reviews is, because we've got Wave Hill into RFO first, then understand there's the organisation review, there's a review into open project, and then there's a, a wider review into all funding streams. So if you could give us um, the targets for each of those um, so that the committee is informed, that would be very helpful in the, at the outset. Happy would you to be able take, to do that? Happy to take that away as an action. Um, what I can try and simplify it just now in, in this moment is to say that there are three strands to it. One is about our kind of strategic review, which is about our purpose and our priorities. So who and what are we here for? The second is about our funding model as a whole. So that's all our routes to funding. And the third one is about organisational development, which is about culture and values and behaviours and systems, structures and processes. So that's, that's the three, strategic review, funding review and organisational review. Okay, and so things like the, the open project, that's part of one of them, that's part of the funding review? Well, it, it will feed into it, but these are, these are um, that's a good example of where we already see opportunities before we even conduct that wider review involving conversations with the sector. How we can it's smarten... Work. Sorry, it's I'm separate. sorry to... Right, is that a separate piece of work? It is, it's complementary. It's sorry. stuff that we can act on yeah. now. Can you, yeah. can you write to the committee with sure. a list of all the different pieces of work that you're that you're currently undertaking and the timetables for them? Yes. So that the committee can, can scrutinise them. Thank you. We'll be happy to do that. Right. Tavish Scott, did you have questions? I know that you want to speak about the screen sector, but did you also have more general questions? Yeah. Okay, maybe you could ask all your questions just okay. now then. Um, uh, I nearly think you'll spend more time writing to the committee than you will doing all these reviews, uh, Mr Munro. Um, I actually wanted to ask about uh, and to reflect on last year because uh, on, the, on the funding, uh, uh, because by definition, when you um, award money to arts bodies, there are some who don't get it, so there are winners and losers. The losers, as we know last year, um, quite understandably, um, kicked up about that, as, as inevitably and in fairly they would. They got in touch with the MSP, MSPs raised it in Parliament, first minister's questions, the whole works. So I guess my question is, uh, and then you get pressure, no doubt you get the heavy call from the, from the Cabinet Secretary, you get civil servants phoning up from the sponsoring department, um, saying there's lots of parliamentary pressure to change your position. So I guess my question is, uh, the robustness of your review on funding uh, as to how you'll be able to ensure that um, when that happens in the future, as inevitably it will, um, the organisation can say, look, we have done this absolutely transparently and clearly, and we have absolute confidence we've made the right decisions on allocating funds to the following organisations, and yes, those didn't get it. So we're really saying to you, Cabinet Secretary, please don't second-guess us. Is that what you're trying to achieve through the review you've been describing to my colleagues this morning? Yes, absolutely, but I, you know, I don't want to give you assurance that, yes, of course, there's a lot of interest and scrutiny from, uh, from a Scottish Government um, perspective, and we have regular uh, meetings, as you would expect, um, through our, our kind of sponsor relationship with the Scottish Government, and, and that's a, a very supportive relationship. Um, you know, the Cabinet Secretary is very clear that, you know, she's not interfering. 
um, but does want to ensure that our organisation can stand up in a very transparent and accountable way to the scrutiny that inevitably arises on, on the processes that we run. So what we're uh, in, endeavouring to do is to get a much stronger position on that, where there is full trust and confidence in those processes um, in, in the eyes of the applicant organisations in this sector more widely. And as, no, that's fine. And as part of that, therefore, presumably you'd look to the Cabinet Secretary, to the Government, to make clear that when you've done your review and the Government, by definition, is comfortable with that, I take all the convener's points about writing to the committee and making sure the committee is consulted, but that, um, in effect, you need Government to say, look, this is our body. They're responsible for making funding allocations to arts bodies. Uh, we expect them to get on with that, and we trust them to do that. Yes, and, and as an independent, non-departmental public body, that's entirely appropriate and right. Yeah, yeah. and that's and the, the initial... I'm sure you've shared your thinking about these reviews with the government and had those discussions already. Uh, they are already, I take it, accepting that principle that uh, it's not their job to interfere with your operational budget, uh, operational uh, decisions over funding different bodies. Yes, yeah. and, the, and they fully respect and honour that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But as I said, it's absolutely appropriate for them to, uh, to want to ensure that we are, as a, a, a non-departmental public body, expending public funding, that we're doing that in, in, in a confident way, in a, in a kind of position of uh, trust and confidence, but also transparently. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stuart McMillan. Um, thank you, convener. Um, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Uh, just as a, a couple of questions regarding the uh, screen uh, Scotland. Uh, and just the first thing I actually just want to put in the record is uh, uh, I think the website uh, is uh, very uh, effective. I think it's also very uh, easy to navigate. And um, I, I just I wanted to uh, kind of make you aware. I mean, obviously there have been a number of criticisms in the past, but uh, I think that's actually uh, that's uh, uh, that'll be a very useful tool uh, to opening Scotland up for uh, for further activity. Um, we had the debate uh, on our. Um, report uh, last week in the chamber and uh, also kind of one of the the continual issues that has uh, has arisen um, over the uh, something over that uh, piece of work but also prior to that was the issue of a uh, of some type of um, uh, film studio and uh, kind of, uh, uh, not just a, uh, not just um, kind of some type of kind of a temporary facility or uh, something that's just been converted, but actually um, purpose-built, um, attractive uh, studio location. Uh, now, obviously, the, the issue regarding Pentlands is, uh, is still underway, as we know. Um, but can, can you provide further information in terms of you know, where we actually are with, uh, with any uh, new investment uh, to come in uh, to Scotland via uh, some type of uh, new studio? So on, on the studio, you'll have seen from our written evidence that we were um, pleased to have secured in principle um, agreement from the Cabinet Secretary on behalf of the Scottish Government um, to the business case that we had submitted uh, uh, in June. Um, that business case, just to be absolutely clear, is a very comprehensive technical document that uh, we were required to undertake in accordance with the uh, HM Treasury Green Book appraisal, which covers a kind of structured approach um, in that business case to cover areas of strategy or finance um, and um, economics and risk and so on. Um, since then, uh, we, as part of that approval, had further technical work uh, requested to be undertaken, which we've done over the course of the summer. Um, and in parallel to that, we've been gearing up um, towards being able to go live with uh, the proposition that's been approved in principle by the, by the Scottish Government. Um, it's hard to say any more about the detail of that yet because we're in a very delicate stage at the moment um, in terms of commercial negotiations with the prospective landlord about that proposition. Um, and it would be premature to say anything, uh, uh, pr premature and prejudicial potentially, to say anything further about the detail of that. But what I would want to give you confidence and assurance on is that the central importance of this as part of transforming the opportunities for the industry as part of this um, five-year plan that Screen Scotland is, is uh, working on with the partners um, is an absolute recognition of that. It's, it's one of the central priorities for us and a uh, key focus that we've been working on. We've never been so advanced in terms of the, uh, the point at which we're uh, uh, now at in comparison to previous iterations of uh, the studio 
infrastructure because you remember in 2014-15 we ran the tender process with Scottish Enterprise that um, was non-site specific um, but it also took place in a completely different landscape and context um, so the technical position on the studio case and, and so on is very advanced but what um, uh, I'm highlighting is that the set of conditions in which we're about to embark on an actual tender process um, to name uh, a site and location um, to attract a private sector operator to be uh, the operational partner to deliver it um, in partnership with the public sector um, is within the context of Screen Scotland where we've got enhanced funding, we've got an enhanced um, screen commission and location service, enhanced screen skills and expertise um, uh, and relationships with the sector and so on. So the, the, the conditions are right and absolutely ripe and it is an absolute priority for us to ensure that we now get this over the line in a way that we haven't been able to do before and we're very, very close to, uh, to that now in a way that we haven't been before. Uh, will this be uh, kind of one uh, kind of studio or will there be uh, multiple uh, studios that could be uh, uh, designed and generated and, uh, and built across what the country? So what we're focused on is a specific proposition, but it absolutely is the case that that will sit amongst other studio offers within Scotland. And, and we know, and there's agreement on the fact that uh, Scotland can sustain more than one studio operation. Um, what we're focused on is this single proposition, but that's complementary to Ward Park, um, the Pyramids, uh, and indeed Pentland. Um, and um, clearly they're considering their position in, in, in in that regard, but um, but there are beyond even those. There are other uh, kind of temporary facilities that that some productions find more favourable. Um, but of course, the central proposition that we're working on as a permanent um, studio uh, with a private operator is um, is significant to ensure that we've got that long term stability at the heart of the infrastructure for Scotland going forward. Okay. Um, certainly, I mean, I've raised this before. I've raised it again last week. Uh, just in terms of the actual locations. Uh, uh, no doubt um, uh, Screen uh, Scotland will uh, consider somewhere like Glasgow or Edinburgh uh, as, the, uh, as the primary location uh, for, uh, for a new studio. Uh, and I can understand why in terms of the catchment, in terms of the, the bigger city uh, offerings. But uh, there is also a world outside of the cities in Scotland. And, uh, and as I said last week in the chamber, uh, I think there is a there, uh, there would be um, a welcome uh, to actually have some type of offer uh, in Inverclyde because there is a space there. There, are, uh, there is a, a talent pool already there, a, a creative talent pool as well as the skills talent pool, um, and uh, it's something something I would like you to consider. I think we could all make a pitch for our own areas, uh, Mr. McMillan, um, and uh, I'm sure uh, the Creative Scotland will, will take that point on board. Um, I think we have a supplementary here from uh, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, you, I was hoping you could be able to tell me a wee bit more about the studio proposals. I understand you're in negotiations at the moment, so that might be sensitive, but you've described it as a private operator would come in to run the facility, but um, I'm still unclear about how the is it going to be purpose built and would, who pays for the infrastructure, who pays for the building of the facility? The, the, is that meant, are you looking for private sources for that as well? You've described oh. the private operators running it, but I don't understand how it's going to be. Yeah, and I, I've got to be careful in terms of yeah. my ability to fully answer that um, question at this point in time, but I'll explain how and why. But in terms of what I can say now, um, the issue of state aid has been um, uh, raised many, many times. There are two key steps that will enable us to address and manage the state aid issue that are part of what we're doing. The first on that is to run an actual tender process. So the business of market failure, which is a, a kind of steep key state aid consideration. The process of the tender will um, be in, in itself um, helping to address the issue of state aid. So we, you know, we are not as the public sector um, um, solely delivering that studio. The second component part is the tender itself will be seeking a private sector um, interest, an operator, to partner with the public sector in order to deliver that studio in, in capital and physical terms and then go on to operate it. 
the actual nature of and proportion of the public-private sector partnership there will depend on the response to that tender. But what's very important is the combination of the two issues uh, for state aid purposes, the actual tender itself and securing private sector interest and investment alongside public sector. Um, those two combined will, will help address the state aid issue. Um, so in due course, once we're clearer, once we've gone through the tender and named the, the site location and um, can secure that um, preferred operator, we will then um, work on the kind of negotiated deal that will understand the kind of nature of the public-private sector arrangement and actually the governance uh, arrangements that will sit alongside that. Okay, that, that's helpful. Thank you. And can I just ask, so the new Executive Director for Screen Scotland, um, when we did the inquiry, there was some concerns raised that that role would be not exclusive for Screen. I think you've given a commitment that it will initially be, but I'm not sure what the future plans for that Executive Director role is. So, uh, absolute assurance to the committee again that Isabel Davis, who's uh, in, very firmly in post now and very firmly focused on screen, will continue for the foreseeable future. We will take stock of this issue as part of the organisational development re review, which also is going to be looking at structures um, to ensure that Isabel's focus remains on screen. The additional element of um, the job description that she was recruited against um, we will continue to reflect on as part of that process. But, you know, I want to absolutely uh, assure you that Isabel is here to lead Screen Scotland. Um, and uh, I don't see any change to that, um, that focus for the foreseeable future um, at all. Um, and we'll reflect further on that to, to ensure that that's absolutely clear going forward. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Ross Creer. You know, um, I was glad to hear what you said, Ian, about uh, this proposal being much further advanced than where previous ones have been. I think it'd be <coughs> fair to say that as much as uh, since it hit the Herald on Sunday a couple of weeks ago and, and even what you'd said to the, the committee previous to that, there's been a lot of enthusiasm and welcome words from the industry, but also a healthy amount of scepticism because there are a number of people who feel like we have been here before, we have heard this before and nothing has materialised. So what I'd be interested in in this case is once you're at the point where you can go public with a specific uh, proposal, what are your plans for industry consultation, not with those who will be submitting uh, in the tender process, uh, but with those in the wider industry who obviously have a key stake in seeing a successful site being uh, actually coming into fruition? Specifically in relation to the studio? Yes. Yeah. Um, so the process itself will, will procure the preferred operator that, as, as I said to Claire Baker, will then uh, absolutely bottom out the arrangements and so on. I think that's a key moment where once the operator is, is known, they will be able to engage directly themselves and we can help facilitate that um, to understand what the needs and expectations of the, the sector more widely are. There's a lot of information already known and a lot of kind of ambition and expectation is already um, known and understood about what um, the sector are, are looking for. But I understand absolutely the point that's being made that, you know, it's got to be clear that this will help address uh, the needs of particularly the, the indigenous uh, sector within Scotland um, to ensure that it has uh, a relevance and a, uh, an appropriate offer to them too, as well as, of course, the work that we do to promote incoming productions from uh, beyond Scotland. Is your role in the process partly to ensure that that engagement between the potential developer and the wider industry happens? Do you see it? Not, not just that you would recommend it, but that you will ensure that engagement happens? We will facilitate that process, yes. Um, I think, I mean, in reality, though, it's hard until we actually get to that point of knowing who the operator is. Um, it, you know, we won't set that as a requirement within the tender, per se, but uh, uh, as a criterion, if you like. Um, but it will be important for us to have that conversation with the, the operator in due course to ensure that that takes place, yes. Thank you. What's the time scale for when will you be announcing the operator? So that will come on the back of the tender. The tender we will be able to go live with um, as soon as we're able to finish the negotiation with the preferred landlord on the on the proposed location. Skill. It's in the hands of that negotiation principally, but I'm I'm uh, hopeful that it will be sometime in the next few weeks. And then 
weeks, right? Okay. Well, that's, that's and the good. tender process itself then will be live for a number of weeks and, and will conclude um, in the new year if all of that right. timescale plays out. So realistically, when could we see our film studio? In 2019-20. Right, okay, yep. that's great. Um, thank you very much for that. Just to wrap up another couple of things in, t in terms of, of this, the screen unit, you're aware this committee has very strong view that we should have a standalone screen agency and we'll continue to monitor the progress of that and continue to make that case. But uh, in terms of where we are at the moment with the screen unit, we, we had a number of other uh, uh, areas of concern and I just wanted to run a couple of them past you. Um, how is business development support going to be tailored? Um, uh, obviously, you have a collaboration with Scottish Enterprise uh, with regards to that. So I wonder if you could tell us, um, again, timescales and what business development support is going to be recruited. Um, and also in terms of um, data, data gathering was an issue that came out in our inquiry as, as being uh, not as robust as it could be in terms of the screen sector. And we were particularly concerned in terms of the evidence that we took that there should be dedicated data gathering for the screen unit, um, not, not just part of overall data gathering within Creative Scotland. So I wonder if you could address those two aspects, the business development support and the data gathering. Okay, so business development support first. Um, in place at the moment uh, are two key um, business support, targeted business support services. So this is beyond the general uh, business offer, um, which is uh, on behalf of all the partners on the single front door website, which uh, Stuart McMillan referenced earlier on. Um, those two key specific targeted um, business development support initiatives in partnership with Scottish Enterprise are FOCUS, um, which is about um, uh, support for uh, production companies, um, across a range of skills and expertise um, and a programme called DEEP which is about individual producers and uh, a partnership with the BBC and Channel 4 to connect them with um, production opportunities and, and commissioning of work and so on. Um, in many regards they are, are pilots um, and they are being uh, evaluated in due course. The focus project is two year pilot, the DEEP project is um, three years. Um, and they're scalable. Um, so these are very targeted, live, current, specific business development opportunities that exist at the moment that um, so far are, are proving positive for those that are engaging with them. In a wider sense, what we're also doing, um, we're recruiting business development uh, specialists within the Screen Scotland team. Um, that's in the, th the phase three jobs that we're now embarking on. Um, and they will be there as, as kind of, uh, the, the kind of fulcrum of uh, the business development support across the partnership, which is being discussed in the widest sense across all five partners, um, but also involving the business gateway um, in terms of the offer across the whole of the uh, 32 local authorities. Um, and that's not just about screen, that's also about the wider creative industries. There are 84,000 um, people employed in the creative industries in Scotland and, and 15,000 businesses. You know, so for, it's, it's for all of them as well, uh, as well as Screen, um, but Screen will benefit from the, that kind of wider partnership conversations. So we're looking at how we can strengthen our own skills and expertise within the organisation to complement these targeted programmes, whilst we continue to um, look at the wider partnership with the Business Gateway to strengthen its offer to ensure that it's delivering effectively for, for creative businesses too. Um, again, we'll be happy to keep um, people uh, up to date on progress as we go through that because um, uh, it's fundamentally one of those planks within the, uh, the plan for Screen Scotland and the five year uh, plan that we've set out. Um, and, and we'll communicate on that uh, in due course, but um, there's already measures in place, as I say, that, um, that people can access and, and we'll be happy to, ke to keep very quickly update us on the data because um, our clock is ticking. <laughs> um, well, it's a very short and quick answer to that. Anyway, uh, again, as part of our recruitment, we've got a specialist um, recruited into the organisation to enhance our knowledge and research team um, who is going to be helping to shape the next steps on actually how we improve that, that data, uh, data hub proposition that was in the, the business case for the, the Screen Scotland five-year plan. So again, we'll be happy to report back. We don't actually have a dedicated screen data specialist. Yes, that's the person that we've just recruited. They're dedicated to screen. Dedicated to screen, right. and, yes. And they, will, and they will be progressing the hub. We will have a hub. 
Yes, seen. in some way, shape or form. Uh, I think um, uh, we uh, need to see what their their own reflections on that are with uh, with the partners about what the actual form of that is, but absolutely the enhancement of data capture, gathering and analysis and playing that back out um, is an important strand of the work that we're doing. The expectation in the sector is that there would be a dedicated hub for screen, but I'm aware that this is it was a very... Um, long inquiry and a weighty report and uh, we haven't really had the time I feel to kind of really dig into it at this session but um, the committee has expressed a, a, a desire to continue uh, to monitor progress in screening I'm no doubt we'll be speaking to you again about it in the future. Thank you very much uh, for coming to give evidence to us today and we shall now um, close and go into private session. Thank you. <laughs>